So to kick things into gear, I'll throw to Dan Breyer, our Beef and Lamb Genetics General Manager, to share a little bit about the Beef and Lamb involvement in this progeny test and a bit of a short overview of the project. Cool. Thank you very much, Sarah. So um, welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. This is, this is, a, um, this is a really important project. I like this project. Um, across what we do at Beef and Lamb, which is so, so wide all the way through the supply chain. Um, what I really like about this particular project, the ethically raised um, high, value, high value land project, is it's really thinking about what customers want and what customers will really need in the future. So one of those things we, we often talk about as farmers, trying to, trying to provide what a customer wants. Um, and this is the opportunity for us actually to start doing it. So. Um, thanks very much for coming um, and online as well and for your uh, interest in our project here. It's worthwhile, I guess it's worthwhile noting that um, Taste Pure Nature is a really important part of what we do at Beef and Lamb, helping to drive, um, uh, helping to drive customers and consumers around the world to look for New Zealand produce. And so this is a, a really clear and direct link from the farm through to our conscious feeder, who's after um, well-raised, ethically raised products, safe products, and safe means different things in different parts of the world, um, safe products, and really well looked after lamb. So thanks very much for coming along. What we're trying to do here, what we're trying to achieve, are low input um, animals, so minimal intervention, robust to common diseases, and environmentally efficient. So what, we, what we'll get an opportunity to see today and hear from some of the experts who are working on those challenges um, and see the progress that's been made over time. Some acknowledgements. So um, Beef and Lamb funds this project alongside uh, Ministry of Primary Industries through the Sustainable Farming Fund. Um, we've got a steering group and we'll hear from the steering group members today, but really important to acknowledge the efforts that they've gone to to help us get here uh, and deliver this for us. So that's uh, Daniel Wheeler, Kate Broadbent, Alan Richardson, uh, and Robert Peacock. Dave Reed deserves a special mention too for helping pull this together back in the, um, in the first instance. A couple of other thank yous. Thank you to uh, Robert and Alex for having us. Um, out here on a beautiful day uh, in, at Arari Gorge and for hosting the progeny test. Um, I'm sure those of you who are involved in progeny tests will know it's um, a real task and it's a, a really important thing that people do to make sure that we can provide the, the underpinning information for our genetic evaluations across the industry. So thanks very much to, um, to Robert and Alex for having us here. Uh, thank you to AgriSearch and the PGGRC. So this is particularly um, as we think about those, those emissions. So the PGGRC is the Partial Greenhouse Gas Research Consortium, which Beef and Lamb and other industry organisations have been investing in for uh, 15 odd years now to try and find some solutions to um, methane production in sheep and beef farming systems. I'm going to steal just a couple of minutes that's not on the agenda here just to mention um, the referendum that's coming up for Beef and Lamb New Zealand. So every six years as farmers you get the opportunity to vote uh, on the referendum. Uh, that's coming up, it's going to, going to run into July of this year. Um, that's all we'll say about it here. One really important thing you've got to do is remember to register. So you would have seen um, in the entry as you came in the door, this little flyer. Um, so can you grab one of those, check on that, that you're registered to vote, uh, and then you'll have the opportunity to have your say around whether beef and lamb continues uh, or not in the future. Hopefully you'd like to continue it. Uh, with that said, We're on. Uh, with that said, uh, thanks very much for coming. Thank you to Robert for having us. Uh, and I'm going to pass over to the next speaker. Enjoy your day. If you have any questions or anything you want to catch up with me about, uh, please do. I should also note, sorry, Robert, just before you start, we've got some beef and lamb directors here, which is great to see. So I see Kate in the back row and uh, Nikki as well. So if you've got any questions, particularly around that referendum and the strategy of beef and lamb, feel free to either speak to me or one of those two guys as well. Thank you, Sarah. So now I'm going to pass to Robert, who's been running this progeny test here at Arari since 2019. Uh, Robert and his fantastic team, many of which are uh, sitting at the back there today, 
uh, do a great job of looking after the stock in this progeny test. And it's not an easy one to run. There's a lot of, um, a lot, many, many measurements to take. And it requires quite a lot of uh, work. So we're very grateful to the team here. Um, Robert's going to share some of his management methods and observations since starting and some of the results from the 2019 and 2020 cohorts. Thanks, Robert. Very good. But, but on, Dave. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah, just like to, to welcome everyone here today. Um, just a, a bit of background about Arari Gorge. So, for those online as well as those in the room, um, so we're just in the foothills of South Canterbury, where just over 4,000, nearly 4,500 hectares, we're 10% flat, um, which you can see in the distance of that uh, slide, 15% sort of rolling to steep lower hill, and 75% um, tussock country. So if you're standing out in the car park and you look up, everyone asks if we go up the hill, well, the furthest you can see that way is actually the middle of the farm. Um, so this photo here is taken from the middle of the farm, and um, that's sort of where our, our deer are running, but um, to the left and to the right is where our, our sheep, so we're lambing twins out there. Um, that's a sort of country they're expected to lamb on. Um, it does rain here, yeah, we, everyone's dry this year, but um, we can get very wet. We're wet more than we're dry. And a wet, although wet does help the grass grow, it also makes it a pretty ideal environment for worms. So worms are a, a continual challenge for us pretty much every year. The, the lambs don't really get a break. Um, so we're running about 24,000 stock units. We're 50% sheep, sort of just over 8,500 ewes, 25% uh, cattle with um, just over 700 pregnant cows in the winter, including pregnant heifers, and 25% deer. So about um, going up to 1,700 hinds out on the hill this year. Um, so why, why a progeny test? So beef and lamb have been running progeny tests for 20 years now, and the key behind any progeny test is, is linkage. If you're gonna buy a ram, and you're looking at the breeding values, um, are they, what do those breeding values mean? Can you compare a breeding value with a Romney in Southland to a, a Coopworth in, in Northland? And the Coopworth farmers aren't gonna use a Romney to, um, to compare. So the, the progeny tests have to do that for them. So that's the key aim um, behind a progeny test. So the next question is why a low input progeny trial? Well, um, because of the issues the industry is facing. So labor is getting harder to get. The drenches are failing. 60% of North Island farms now have um, drench resistance to the triple combination drenches. And also the consumers don't want the chemicals in the product. So it's um, higher consumer awareness about what we're doing on farm. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and the, the labor, I'll come on to this a bit later, but it's one thing having to drench the sheep, but also it's all the other work. It's the crutching, it's the dagging, it's the dipping, um, starting right at the beginning of the process, it's the tailing. Um, so it, it is getting harder and harder to find the staff. And, um, and we need to find ways of reducing costs. Um, also, as Dan has um, alluded to, the, the Taste Pure Nature campaign for the sort of ethically sustainably produced food, more and more consumers around the country want to know what's, what's in their food. Okay, so um, what, why, why is it here? So there's a few reasons why it's here. Um, one is I'm probably the only person stupid enough to volunteer to, to host it. Um, No, that's down there. Is it just this too close to the mic? I'll put it, that's down there. We'll try that, I'll put it in my pocket. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, quite ironic that a low input trial involves quite so much work. Um, there, is, there is a huge amount of work and, um, and a huge thank you um, to the staff here 
because it, it is quite different with the amount of work we're doing. We're always doing stuff um, this week, as well as hosting a, a field day today. We've had the methane trailer. So every day, all day, every day, we've had lambs coming in, drafted left, drafted right, through the methane trailer, put back out, um, changing teasers over this morning, changing crayons, um, AIing um, use. I went to a discussion group a couple of weeks ago. So, oh, sorry, I'm late. We're AIing you because I couldn't come. And um, they all just looked at me and said, oh, I've heard this really novel idea, Rob. What you do is you, you find a stud breeder and you go and buy some rams and you just put them out with the ewes and, and they do it for you. And um, whereas we spent sort of eight days in the shed um, doing AI. Um, so, yeah, I, I do understand it's, it's a huge amount of work. Um, it was sort of my choice to take it on. It wasn't so much the, the shepherd's choice to take it on, but um, so a huge thank you to you guys for, for the work you do. Um, I just thought, like to point out the obvious conflict of interest is yes, we do have sheep studs here and it's not normal practice for beef and lamb to host a progeny test on a stud farm for the obvious conflict of interest. But, but as I say, I was potentially the only one stupid enough to put my hand up and, and volunteer. Um, it had taken us a few years from the development of the theory of hosting a low input trial to actually getting the funding. Um, I was really concerned that it was, might fall over because no one was going to host it. Um, I spoke to Beef and Lamb, but I'll just so you know, if you're struggling for anywhere else, we could potentially look at hosting it here. Um, they said, oh, no, it's okay. We, we think we've got Telford lined up. And, um, and then literally three days later, there was the announcement that um, Peritay was going into liquidation. So they were concerned that Telford might not be a, a safe long-term bet. So they came and had a look, and sure enough, no one else was was keen. So it, it ended up being here. Um, I mean, my personal beliefs behind the low input, I mean, I've been really passionate about this low input for years. Um, university in the 90s, I did my honours on drench resistance and alternative methods of drench control. I'm really concerned the industry as a whole either doesn't realise the issues in front of us or is just putting the head in the sands, hoping it'll go away, but it's not going to go away. The drenches are failing. The, the workload is mounting. The workers are hard to get. The costs are rising. So we've got to find another way. And um, genetics are a serious option in reducing those costs and reducing the workload. They're not going to fix it overnight. It's a slow fix and it's possibly not a total fix. You've got to in include the management on farm as well. But the genetics to me are a, a really huge part of the potential answer. Um, so, um, sorry. Um, yeah, um, I mean, with, with my stud, I don't, I don't want to talk about my stud as much, but we're our own biggest client with our commercial flock. So it's really important to me that we're doing the right thing with the stud to provide the genetics for our commercial flock. And as a stud breeder, it's really hard to go and find those outside sires from studs that are also selecting for the same traits. Um, WormFAC, which is the genetic program selecting for worm resistance, has been in existence for nearly 30 years now. Um, a few years ago, there were still only 40 breeders out of about three or 400 registered breeders on SIL that are, are selecting for worm resistance. Um, it's always a gamble when I go and buy an outside sire. Um, from a stud that's not recording those traits, whether it's worm resistance or DAGs or worm resilience, how they're gonna handle my environment. And um, so, I mean, having a progeny test here, one, it gives me a chance to see those outside sides. So I'm very lucky from that point of view, I can see them in my environment. But the main thing behind it for us as, as a steering committee was trying to encourage other stud breeders to select for these traits. So we've got more, we've, we're all had the same problem. It wasn't just me, all the different stud breeders that are selecting for it are really limited where they could go for their outside genetics. So hopefully getting a bit of awakening, more breeders would select for these traits and the whole industry can help each other go forwards. Um, so moving on to the trial itself, um, we had uh, 17 rams chosen from around the country, uh, covered about 10 different breeds. We AI'd just over a thousand um, or we'll program just over a thousand, AI just under a thousand of just our own commercial Romney use. 
um, and that and that was the start of it. So the first cohort was um, was born in 2019. Um, we've got just finished our third mating, so it might be a bit hard to read if you want to sit right at the back. But there's the different studs involved, and um, and like I was saying, trying to get stud breeders to select for these traits, and there weren't many doing it earlier. The number of breeders that are selecting for those traits has climbed drastically in the last three years. And also this year, the number of stud breeders wanting to get a ram into this progeny test has climbed dramatically as well. So it really does look like it is gaining some traction. Um, the stud breeders are starting to listen, but it's up to the commercial guys as well. The commercial guys need to go to that stud breeder and say, are you selecting for this? Uh, what are you doing about that? Are you recording it? Um, how do I know this ram is ranked number one for growth, but if I take it home and don't drench very often because I've just discovered I've got drench resistance, are they still going to cope? Um, so it's really important to get those conversations going, and it looks like it really is gaining some traction. Um, so the management, so it starts with the AI, so that was just taken a couple of weeks ago, this year's AI, um, the team there, and um, Julia Aspinall deserves a mention from Genetic Gains, does the AI for us. Um, runs a pretty good program. And like I've learned with a lot of these things, you, you pay the professionals to come and do a job. You've got to listen to what they tell you. And I think the results we had in the second year versus the first year were, were quite dramatic because I actually learned the hard way of not sort of thinking I might've known better on a couple, tried a couple of a few corners. Second year did what I was told and um, the results spoke for themselves. It was great. Um, so next thing is lambing. So these are the progeny trial lamb, lambs, the twins born on the front country, and then the, the singles born on that hill behind. Um, unshepherded, we'll just go around them about once a week, just check for casts and things. Um, singles, we didn't go near, because as you can see, very hard to go around. Um, next thing was tailing. Um, and the first thing we did was measure the tails and then not take the tail off. So we tailed the ewe lambs, we left the boys um, with their tails on. A um, lot of say, why? Okay, well, there's, there's two things. One is that's, that's the way the world is possibly moving. Um, as of this year, we thought last year we had to leave the tails longer. This year, we've got to leave them longer again. It's possibly not that far in the future that we won't be able to tail at all. And when you leave the tails on, it changes everything, like the dags and the fly and stuff. Um, you think you've got rams that don't leave dags, you, you leave the tails on and you'll find out you might not be quite so clever. Okay. Um, so then we moved on to weaning. So everything was obviously weighed at weaning. Um, we dag scored all the lambs. Um, the first year we did crutch the lambs, the, the boys. Um, this year we chose not to because they were mostly clean. Um, we dipped them instead. With, with the, the lambs, they were then supposed to stay drenched um, for as long as possible. So what we did was we had a control mob that was, everything was drenched at weaning. Um, the control mob was identified. A month later, I'd bring them back in and would weigh them all and would drench just that control mob that was running in the same paddock with them. And we'd do that every month. So it's not just a weight gain from A to B or even A to F with a few in between, but it's compared to animals in the same paddock in the same year that are drenched at regular intervals. Because if you go from sort of December through to May and find they've only grown a 100 grams a day, well, was it worms or was it the season or was it the clover or was it the management? You don't know. So if you've got the control mob getting drenched, the only difference is the drench. Um, um, we, so we dipped them at weaning. We then dipped them again at end of January. So it's about six weeks later. They were weaned on about the 9th of December. And they had to get through to end of March, middle of March for kill. And they were already pretty shitty when we dipped them at the end of January. And I was really worried the dip wasn't going to last. And we're going to start getting fly sort of a week out from the proposed slaughter date. But luckily, we didn't. Um, the, the dip did its job. Um, and we got through. Um, so we've got a few live weights here. So this is just from this year. Um, don't worry about the numbers. I've got a graph coming up. Um, 
But this is the, the first year. So on the left, we've got the males. So weaning to the first weighing, obviously doing pretty well. And then they plateaued. And the, the, the bottom line here is the um, control mob. And they also plateaued. So that wasn't worms. That was because I, the worm count when I tested them wasn't high enough. And I purposely put them under pressure, grazed down to a lower residual, trying to make them ingest more worms, put them under more pressure. So it wasn't just a case of drench them, put them on the clover or the crop, and then kill them two months later and say, wow, that was great. We didn't do much. And they grew. Um, they were back on the lambing paddocks, ingesting worms under pressure. And, um, but when you don't feed them as well, the, the drench doesn't help, the control mob. So they did ingest more worms. We then fed them a bit better. And even with the increased worm burden, they still kept on growing. Um, the females were, um, were pretty constant through their growth. Um, they didn't have a control mob with them the first year. Um, and you can see that the, the control mob, they did catch up to a certain extent. They were growing faster. Um, but the undrenched ones went from 10th of December all the way through to the end of May without a second drench. And they were still growing at about 114 grams a day. So that doesn't include the first bit. I think the first bit, they were closer to 200 grams a day. And then when we put them under pressure, they went backwards. And including that bit under pressure going backwards, they were over 100 grams a day, which is actually the national average on sheep that are being drenched every three weeks. So I know everyone talks pub talk about 300 grams a day. Well, it doesn't happen in reality. If everyone's lambs grew at 300 grams a day, there wouldn't be a lamb left in the country after Easter. And, um, and we all know that's not true. Um, so, so the growth rates were, were acceptable. The control mob was catching up, but still didn't actually catch them. The control mob started lower because they were born different. They weren't from the trial. They were some of my own lambs that were born on the hill and born a little bit later. So it, it wasn't a fair comparison in terms of weaning weight, but the, the growth curves had the potential to, to be the same. Um, the reason we kept the boys all the way through to May um, was because we had to make a decision before we'd even done the AI. And we didn't know what we're gonna be in store for by doing this trial. And also we wanted to measure as much data as possible. And we didn't want to do the AI, book in a kill date and have everything planned around an early kill. And then find, well, first of all, we've only got half the lambs we'd hope we're gonna get because the AI didn't work or the, the lambing storm. And, um, and secondly, the more lambs you've got to measure the data, the more accurate the data is. Um, so we made the decision to keep them right the way through to May. Um, they killed out at 20 kilos, which without having had a drench from, for five months was, was pretty good. They could have easily nosedived at any stage. Um, the, what, there was one little trick I did learn, and that was the power of clover. So, so the ewe lambs in February, so eight weeks after um, their first drench, was two and a half thousand and, and they looked like it. They looked pretty average. We put them on the clover and three days later, they looked like different animals. They were kicking their heels up and running around. It was unbelievable. No drench, just on clover. So about a week on clover then, that's all it was, just a week. Then back on the grass again, gave them another month or two months on grass and then another couple of weeks on the clover again. And, um, and that clover was quite a dramatic learning curve. We're, we're fed they knew at the clover we've only been putting it in about three years and um and we knew it was going to be good and um there's going to be quality benefits in growing lambs but that sort of exceeded our expectations it was it was pretty impressive stuff um the second year we did things slightly different we decided the males are going to be killed earlier so we went for a march kill um to fit in more with what the industry is doing um there's no point saying we're doing a low input trial telling people we kill the lambs in May and everyone says, oh, well, I've got to kill my lambs by Easter. So I'm not interested if you can't kill them till May. So we brought them forwards. The, um, the big spike, it will drop off in the, in the growth, isn't quite as bad as it looks. Um, the main difference was they were 24 hours empty. So it was the day before kill and we'd had to have them in um, for crutching the night before. Um, the crutching I'll come to later, that was a, a major issue but there was, there was dags to take off that weight as well as um, gut fill. 
Um, but yeah, the 24 hours empty versus two hours empty. And most people will seriously underestimate the gut fill involved with truly empty overnight. And not just gut fill, but a bit of dehydration as well. Um, so you can see, I mean, up until the 8th of December through to the 5th of March, that they were pretty, pretty handy weight gains. Um, so you're already getting out to three months without a drench, um, sort of 13, 14 weeks nearly. And, um, and they were still going pretty strong. Um, the ewe lambs weighed on almost the same date each time. And, um, and they drop off a little bit as well. And the main difference there was actually shearing would, would shorn them in that date. They had slipped a bit. They, they certainly got a check. And when you're managing a system like this, where you're trying to push the boundaries a bit and trying not to drench them, you've got to really keep on your A game with the management. And um, I'll put my hand up there after shearing. We, they went through a couple of paddocks and then I put them in a bigger paddock that had a heap of grass in. And I'd go and check them a week later. Yep, no, still heaps of grass. That's good. Another week later, there's actually more grass here than I thought they're still doing well. But you know what sheep are like? They'll sort of, they'll graze down really low the bits they like grazing. And the bits you're looking at are the bits they're not actually grazing. So they'd probably overgraze some parts of the paddock and ingested the worms in the process and come under a bit of stress without me realizing. And I, I did realize, and we, we got them out of there and got them onto some clover. But if I'd shifted them a week earlier, um, it would have made a, the world a difference. Um, so yeah, the, the, you've got to get your management right when you're sort of when you're trying to cut corners on something like drench. You can't cut any other corners on the grazing. Um, so we, we measured the worm fact. So in the end of February, we measured every lamb for an individual worm count. The genetic difference between the sires was huge. Um, we also measured the DAG scores. And I'm going to talk a wee bit about this because to me, if we're not allowed to tail, the drenches fail. I think it's the DAGs that are literally going to break the industry. Because I mean, you talk to any of my shepherds, they, they are horrendous. Um, a, a DAG scoring system works on a, a zero to five scale. Um, for those, you can see the slide there. Probably the dirtiest one there on the right. I would have only scored a three at worst, possibly even might have got away with a two. So you can imagine what the fours and the fives look like. Um, when we crutched them for the works, out of curiosity, I actually weighed some of the dags. We were getting four kilos of dags off a single animal. That's 10% that's of its body weight. Um, so um, the dag scores between the male and the female, weaning, there wasn't much difference. Um, a DAG eight in March, there was a massive difference. But not only that, is when you're DAG scoring, you, you've got to sort of not fudge the figures, but you've got to adjust the sliding scale a bit. Because if they're mostly clean and you score them all zeros and ones, there's no genetic difference between them. So you've got to be a bit harder on the ones, but a little bit might be pushed out to a one, a bit more pushed out to a two. Whereas doing the boys, because they were mainly dirty, I had to sort of move it the other way a bit. So there was a difference between 1.5 average score on the girls to 2.5 average score on the boys. And I was being easier on the boys. So if I'd use exactly the same score, instead of being a one, one score difference, it would have been at least one and a half score difference between them. Um, and, it, it was, and it was purely DAGs. You can see the, the bell curve of the different DAG scores, the girls versus the boys, how, how big it was. Um, this photo was taken, it was only about six weeks after their weaning drench. And you can see those differences already. And, um, and although I'm, I'm sounding a bit negative about the DAGs, what you do need to focus on is, is like the ones on the right. So that they're all in the same paddock, same treatment. The difference is the genetics. So you can, can select the clean ones. And that's what the stud breeders need to do. And that's what the commercial guys need to ask that stud breeder if he's doing it. Um, it's the easiest, cheapest trait you can measure. Every stud breeder is weighing their sheep at least once. Some of them only once, unfortunately. Some of us are weighing them quite often. They're going over the scales. The bum's right there. Just push the button. One, three, done. And, um, and, and before you know it, you're going to have some quite meaningful data. Um, but you think that middle one there, that's only six weeks. Imagine what he looked like 
another six weeks later after that. Um, it's quite quite scary stuff. Um, so after we'd killed the males, the ewe lambs then went down to Invermay, not all of them, there was about 10 progeny from each sire, and they were measured for residual feed intake. I'm not gonna go on too much about that because that's gonna be covered later. Um, as you see, we've got the methane trailer out there. So those gills were measured for methane on the, down at Invermay, and then they were measured for methane again about a month ago on grass. Um, but on the residual feed intake, they're on lucerne pellets because they had to be a dry feed they could eat off the scales to measure their intake. Um, here they were measured off grass. Um, the difference in the methane was quite phenomenal between the, the two, mainly because of the protein of the lucerne versus the low protein of the grass at sort of March time of year. Um, we've just done all the ewe lambs. They've just been through this week. Um, we measured the wool. So we saw the ewe lambs in March. Um, we didn't measure anything then. We then shore them again in December. And so they're all fleece weighed. So we've got a fleece weight. We measured them for color and we, we got every lamb tested for, for fiber diameter as well. So we've got a few different traits being, being measured, measured there for the wool. And um, there'll be more detail available in, in the reports. I'm not gonna go into too many figures here. Um, so so that, that's about it for me today. Um, so later on, we're gonna go out and have a look at them. We've got the ewe lambs in, um, we've got the tutus in. Um, there'll be some people that go out there and say, geez, these aren't looking too flash. And, um, and, and to a certain extent, they're not. Um, as well as struggling with the worms, um, they've also been in and out of the yards all week, not just once, but two or three times getting drafted for the methane, that hasn't helped. But that's every lamb born out there. So if you look at these, I couldn't cope with these as my replacement ewe lambs. Well, first of all, if you had those as your replacement ewe lambs, the first thing any commercial farm would do would take off the bottom 10, 20, maybe even 30%. Three weeks ago, they averaged 37 kilos, every lamb counted. If you took the bottom 30% off, that average actually comes up to 40 kilos, which isn't actually too bad. So we're out at four, um, four and a half months, no drench by then, and they're, that's 40 kilos. So yeah, that's an average. They're not big enough to mate potentially, but you wouldn't have to change your management too much and they would be big enough to mate and probably take quite well. They've got teasers running with them. Um, it's not a farm policy to mate hoggets. So but we did want to know which ones are cycling. And so we do have harnessed teasers running with them. And so you'll see some blue bums. They've only had the teaser for about a week and we just drafted them off and scanned, um, just ear tag scanned the ones that are marked. And out of 500, we've already got 70 marked, um, which I don't think was too bad for the first eight days. Um, and then, but we'll, we've changed the color of the crayons and we'll, we'll do it again in two weeks. And so I get two cycles with the teaser and see how many cycle. Last year, we got 70% cycled. Um, so that was pretty good. Next to them, you'll see the tutus. Um, those tutus looked pretty much like those lambs this time last year. And they're the best tutus I've ever had. They averaged 67 and a half kilos in March, a month before mating. And so, I mean, if you're worried that low input isn't for you when you look at the lambs, just look at the tutus because I think they look pretty special really. Um, so I mean, key, key, key takeaway message for me, the, the genetics work, there is a big difference um, between studs. Most of the rams entered into this trial are from studs that have already been doing this selection for quite a while. And there's still a big difference between them. If you pull in rams that have done nothing and drenched every three weeks, the results might be sort of even, even more dramatic as to what can handle it and what can't handle it. Um, if you're gonna go down the low input trial, don't just put away the drench gun. You've got to take baby steps. If you're drenching every four weeks, just push it out another week, one year. Just weigh them, monitor them. Um, don't expect too much. If you go and buy resistant rams, don't expect them to fix it overnight. The genetics work, but it is a slow game. We've been doing this for 20 years and quite a few other studs in the, this room have as well. It is a slow process. Um, I'm getting a few nods from the crowd. So um, we'll open quickly to questions and then we better move on to the next speaker. Have we got any questions? Oh, yep. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. 
There you go. Uh, this isn't actually a question. Uh, <laughs> just as a participating breeder, I would like everyone to give the staff a round of applause, please. Yeah, hello, my name's Roger Beattie. How long do you think it'll take you to get to where you want to get to? Um, it depends where you want to get to. The, the, the key with any, any journey is the first thing you'll do is find out where you are. Um, so you've got to measure a few things. You've got to have a plan to work out where you want to go to. But the problem with those plans, is the goalposts, goalposts keep moving. So um, the, the results I've seen, no one ram was good at every trait. No one breed was good at every trait. It's, it's not an easy fix. Um, it, you've got to, to a certain extent, pick your winners. Say, well, I can target dags quite easily, but it might cost me in, say, wool or something. Um, or it may, I could just go straight out resistance and they'll live, but they might not grow that fast. So there's compromises. The more traits you select for, the slower you'll go, but at least you keep moving forwards in every trait. Um, if you just want to pick one or two traits, you'll get there a lot quicker. Um, dags, I find pretty heritable. I mean, if you go for a real, a real strong, clean, and I don't just mean a ram that's clean, I mean the breeding values, the family history is behind his individual data. Um, you can move quite quickly, but it is probably not a free lunch. There's, the wool is probably the first thing that's going to go on the dags. Your, your resistance and your resilience is a little bit slower. You, you've got to get it through your new flock. It's, it's not a one cross fix. You, it's a, the, the more you get it through your ewe lambs, your ewes, and then get it through your, your stud rams as well. Um, it really, it's like compound interest. It, it's, it's probably slow to start with, but it builds up rapidly as you, as you keep going. If the government is, or the powers that be, say we're not allowed to tail our land, I think the industry needs at least five, if not 10 years notice. Um, because from what I've seen in this trial, those tails are phenomenal how much difference they make. It is possible, but considering most studs in the country have done no selection for worms or dags, and so that means probably 80% of the commercial sheep out there have had no selection. Um, yeah, it, it's going to take a wee while, but it's certainly doable. I, yeah, I just wondered if there was any correlation you noticed between DAG score and egg, uh, fecal egg counts or anything along that lines? Uh, in my opinion, no. I mean, some people might look at the first year's data and the, the highest worm resistant ram, like with the lowest egg count, was the worst for DAGs and he was the lowest for growth, but had never been selected for DAGs. And he went into the trial with the lowest breeding value for growth. So it didn't, it wasn't really a fair choice. There are, there are other rams in the trial that were second safer fecal egg count and had great growth. And, um, and, and that's the other thing about this progeny trial is that the G, G times E, the genetic variation times by the environment. So we, we've got the Kelso team here. We asked them in year one, because they've been worm fec testing for a while, and they got some quite high performance figures. We asked them, would you mind putting in two rams, one good for fec and maybe not so good for growth, and another ram not so good for fec, but probably one of your top growth rams. And they did exactly that. Um, it was great for them to do it, much appreciated. And it was really interesting when they came to this trial, and they were put under that long-term pressure, the high effect ram, his lambs actually grew faster than the supposed high growth ram because the environment had changed. And um, so when you say is, is the correlation, it would depend under which circumstances. So under a shorter time frame, it might not have had much correlation, but, but under that long drawn out pressure of worms, the, the high effect ram actually shone through and his, his growth was strong. Um, but like I say, there was no clear winner because the, the ram with the, the low effect that was supposed to have good growth still had good growth, but he was number one for clean bums, which was great. The guy that grew a bit faster and had a low effect count did have a few more dags. But you can find ones that are 
good at this and bad at that, and you can find ones the other way around. The, there are some correlations, but there's always exceptions to the rule. Hey, Robert, what um, you, you talked before about what breeders are recording, right? And obviously, early days, but it looks like there's some sort of there's some uh, positive encouragement that there's some some information that you're discovering is really good. So if I think about breeders and you've sort of highlighted there's some, there's some potential barriers there for other breeders to be recording certain information that could be beneficial to the sector in the future, given some regulatory stuff that could be coming at us, et cetera. And for the commercial guys as well, in terms of, you know, lower the cost, increased productivity, et cetera, on farm. Do you have any comments around what some of those barriers could be and how we could encourage or support farmers to change? Um, I think really the, the, the drench resistance is probably going to drive this quicker than regulation. Um, people are going to get forced into a corner and they'll have no option but to either get rid of sheep or to find different sheep. Um, I think the North Island with its facial eczema issue is a good example. Um, there are plenty of North Island stud breeders that didn't do any FE and there are plenty of guys that are serious about it and making great gains. And the, the last few years, the number of breeders that are starting to say, hang on, we're gonna to have to do something here. And they have been able to piggyback off those guys that have done all the work and buy the, a top FE ram and suddenly go off in that direction as well. I think, um, yeah, to a certain extent, I don't think the stud breeders need help as such. They, they, they just need to see the light. <laughs> And um, maybe help to see the light, maybe. Yeah, and 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 the help will be they'll continue to be able to sell rams, but if they don't change, people will stop buying their rams. Um, when the commercial guy realizes that it's not working, they'll they'll walk away and find some rams that are doing the job, and um, and the guys that have done all the work for longer will hopefully get the the benefits. Robert, um, it's possibly not the right time to ask the question, but um, how would you feel about adding um, not dipping to the program? Uh, not, not, not in the next year or two. No, I mean, you, you see those dags, so they would have no hope. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, we, we get fly in here. I mean, I, I don't know whether it's just because of the genetics we've done, we breed tough sheep. We don't use the chemicals more than we need to. Our dips do tend to last quite a while, um, especially compared to some other people we hear about in the district. They're dipping probably more often than us. But with the price of wool and the cost of shearing, people aren't wanting to shear or crutch more often. Um, if we're not going to drench much, and we're certainly with tails on, um, yeah, they haven't, they haven't got a hope with some of those shitty bums. You get rid of the, the shitty bums, you can then start putting the dip away as well. But um, no, it would be an absolute disaster if we hadn't dipped that second time this year. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps I could make some comments on that, Robert. We've dipped once in 23 years and there's definitely a genetic component to fly strike. Um, our own size, um, zero to 1%, um, outside size, up to 24% of their progeny are getting fly struck. So it's a wee bit like the DAG one. If you put them under pressure, you're going to find the winners and the losers. Mm -hmm. And even on a small scale, you get a lot of information off that. In a small scale, it, it's manageable. Um, you wouldn't want to do the whole flock and then it falls to bits. But um, yeah, don't underestimate the, the genetic component of that. Yeah, no, I, I agree there is a, a genetic component on the fly strike, but it is, it is probably strongly linked to the the same genes they're doing the DAGs. If you can, 95% of, of, of fly is coming from DAGs. So if you get rid of DAGs, you're potentially getting rid of fly. And um, there are a few exceptions, which will be genetic. So yeah, you, you, they might be producing DAGs, but they still seem to um, don't need the dip. What, what I found with putting even my own stud sheep under pressure is the, um, the they don't get crook because of the fly. The fly seems to attack the sheep that are struggling, even if they don't have dags. So if they can be more resilient and, and healthier, they are less likely to get. So from that, probably contradicting myself a wee bit there, thinking about it. But yeah, they, yeah, I mean, they, you can get 
clean and sick and they'll get fly. And you get clean or dirty, they're still healthy and strong, they've got more chance of not getting fly. There must be some sort of pheromone they're putting off when they get sick that attracts a fly, because I see it every year. It, it's, it's not the, the fly that makes them go skinny. And the, the skinny ones get fly. We've got one uh, question from online. Uh, if you want to be dredge free through to kill, how valuable do you think the periodic use of clover was? Um, it would depend on whether you're allowed to drench at all and what your mindset was. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the issue with this trial, any progeny test, is they want to kill everything on the same date. So in a normal commercial situation, some of these would have been killable off mum, more would have been killable a month later. Um, so you'd have only had half of them left by March. And with that becomes slightly easier grazing management, lower selection pressure. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you're just gonna graze them without clover, you can still do it, but you've got to make sure you keep residuals up so they're not grazing the worms that are down in the bottom 10% of the sward. Um, but with this trial, I was wanting to put them under pressure. So I was making sure they did ingest those worms. So you say, right, I'm a commercial farm. I just want to get them through without drenching and kill them. Um, if you've got enough grass, you can do it without the pure clover. But the moment they come under pressure, the season isn't quite right for you. They graze a bit lower, they get a challenge. Um, you, you can still do it, but that clover was phenomenal, just how it works, yeah. Yeah, they, they need the protein to grow, but they're also using the protein to fight the worms. And your average summer ryegrass doesn't have a lot of protein in it. Yeah. Further to that too, um, from the research that we're seeing around the place in terms of farms that are dealing with triple drench resistance problems, uh, those uh, clovers and the legumes are a really important part of how they're managing their farm systems to reduce their reliance on mm. uh, anthelmintics. Yeah. And the good thing about clover is the animals don't seem to need to tran transition much to it. I mean, Lincoln have done some work. We've got Chris here. Um, he might want to chip in. Um, they sort of got three or four paddocks of grass in the rotation, and the, the fourth paddock was, was plantain. And, um, and, and that was sort of doing the same effect. And they can just go on it for a few days a week and then back onto the grass. And, um, and it was acting like a drench. They don't, it's not like a crop or lucerne where you've got to pick a mob and transition them onto it and then keep them on it. You can just, each mob can just have its own spell on clover for a week and it does make a world of difference. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we got another question there somewhere? No. No? Okay, okay. Thanks very much for that, Robert. Okay. Um, for those of you that are staying throughout, we'll um, have Robert again outside. So if you have any more questions, we can attack them then. Um, Next up, we're going to have Catherine McRae. Um, Catherine is a scientist in the animal genomics team at Ag Research in May, uh, where she works on a range of projects, including understanding the genetic basis of resistance to diseases such as parasites and pneumonia. This research works to harness the natural variation in the population to work towards breeding sheep, which are less reliant on chemical input. So naturally, she's a great fit for this project. And we welcome her to discuss slow input resilience traits. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, so I got given the brief of talking about low input resilience traits. Um, and first of all, I wanted to start off with, this is not a concept that's new to any of you in the room, hopefully, but genetics is a tool that we can use to help address many challenges. So the research that we do, and I think a lot of the breeders that are in the room would agree, is that we want to use genetic improvement to help provide a better, product, better quality product for our consumers that has less impact on the environment from healthier sheep under better welfare conditions. Now that's a pretty big ask, but today I'm gonna to talk about how we can work on the from healthier sheep component. So to begin with resilience traits, what's in a name? Um, this will come up again when I talk about resilience as a trait in SIL, 
but essentially it depends how you define it. Resistance is quite easy, particularly when we talk about resistance to parasites. We're talking about limiting the load of the parasite or the pathogen. But when we come down to resilience itself, part of it is actually what in, at the moment in the literature is defined as tolerance. So it's limiting the impact of increased infection on performance. Resilience itself kind of captures both of that, the tolerance and the resistance. So they're both complementary defense mechanisms from the sheep's perspective. And it's a me measure of an animal to be minimally affected by disturbances. But ultimately, and as I just said to Russell earlier, what we want is we want animals that combine production potential, high performing animals that also have resilience to external stresses, be that disease or heat stress or whatever else, which means that we have animals that can produce in a wide variety of environments. So what are the tools that are available? This is a summary of um, what we classify as health and welfare traits. The underlined ones are those that are currently recorded by industry. And then we have some others as well that are probably more on the research side at the moment. Today, I'm gonna to talk about three of them. First, they're gonna talk about internal parasites and the different measures we can use to measure internal parasite burden. Um, but then I'm also going to talk about some of the work we've been doing in the pneumonia space and briefly touch on facial eczema as well. So first of all, with parasites, there are a number of ways which you can measure the parasite burden of an animal. Obviously, actually looking at the burden itself is the best measure, but to do that, the animal needs to be dead and you can no longer breed from it. Um, so what we commonly use are th mainly fecal egg count, but people have also looked at DAG score, live weight and antibody response as well. And these three underlined ones lead into different breeding values, which I'll cover. But most people use FEC because it's relative, it's imperfect, but it's one of the best tools we have. It's fairly reliable. It's relatively easy to measure, although anyone who's had to do FEC um, before would probably disagree. And the good thing about it is that it's actually providing us with a direct estimate of pasture contamination. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the term FEC, sorry, it's fecal egg count. How many eggs from the parasite are in the feces of the sheep? In terms of breeding for resistance to parasites, we know that individuals differ in their ability to um, develop resistance to parasites. So that's what we term acquired immunity. Both the rate at which immunity develops, so how quickly it, it starts to increase, and the final levels of immunity. When we talk about immunity, the um, sheep it can manifest in three different ways. The sheep can either suppress the growth of the parasite once it's in there, and so worms are fairly simple in that the female worms, the longer they are, the more eggs they can have. But the sheep can also um, get rid of the parasite burden itself, or it can prevent them even establishing. So that probably should be the other way around. The first one should be preventing the establishment of parasites, suppressing the growth, or getting rid of them altogether. The main um, breeding value that we have for resistance to parasites is called worm feck, and so that is for parasite resistance. First of all, with a trait, we want to know are the differences genetic. This is the original protocol for worm feck. So it starts at weaning when lambs are drenched, and then they're set to pasture. And so they undergo what we call a summer challenge. If the average flock fecal egg count comes up above 800 grams before, I think it's around March, before March. We do um, individual fecal egg counts and get counts for both um, nematodirus and strongyles, and that's termed FEC1. It used to be that you then drenched and set them back to pasture and repeated the process, getting FEC2, but with worm FEC now, you can use either of those two measurements, so FEC1 or FEC2. Um, just to go back to basics, in case there are people in the audience that aren't necessarily breeders and familiar with these terms, what we want to know when we look at all of these traits, um, so what we call a phenotype is a trait of interest, in this case it's fecal egg count, we know that it's a combination of the host animal's genetics and the environment that it's in. So what we're interested in, if this is a fecal egg counts from thousands of animals, and most of them are relatively low, but there's some quite high, how much of that variation is due to the genetics of the animal 
rather than the environment because the animal we can use for breeding and that can be passed on from year to year. So with fecal egg, that's termed the heritability. So that's how well it's going to be passed on to the next generation. With fecal egg count, on average, about 20% of that variation will be passed on. So that means it can be used as a selection tool. And the rest of that 80% is the environment. That then leads on to, into breeding values. I'll stand here and hopefully it still works. So this is just looking at, and I think this leads into some of the discussion we were having earlier. This is a, when it's probably about 20 years old now, but it still holds true. This is what underpins the worm fec breeding values and the worm fec index. So index is a breeding value combined with an economic weight. So this, in the first two columns, are live weight and fleece weight, comparing normal unselected animals with animals that had 50% resistance to parasites. What we're interested in, does this work, is this the benefit of resistant animals. So these are the losses. And so, as you can see here, with no drenching in your lambs, you're going to get a 4.2 um, kilo benefit from having 50% resistant animals. As you go and drench more, so this is three times every six weeks and six times every four weeks, that benefit of the resistant animals decreases for both live weight and fleece weight um, compared with unselected animals. And that's because in that modeling, what's underneath that hood, it's around epidemiology. So if you have animals that are producing less eggs in their feces, that's going to be less larvae on the pasture. And so worm fec isn't so much around individual animal benefit, it's around whole flock benefit. And there's actually been some recent research come out of Australia and Merinos where they grazed unselected animals and animals that were selected for low fecal egg count separately over generations and looked at the benefits. And those benefits were less drench, faster growth and less, less wool. So a lot of people will say that low fec animals don't grow as well, but we're talking about the whole system. Um, less of their energy is going into fighting parasites and more into growth. But those benefits um, in that Australian study were when the animals were grazed separately. So if you just have a few resistant animals in your flock, you're not able The thing to touch on is what we call genotype and by environment. So is a ram that performs, Robert's already talked about this, is a ram that performs really well in one environment, still going to perform well in another one. Um, research was done looking at Coopworth and Romney size across the country. So this was in four to nine month old lambs. They had consecutive field challenges. So this was using the original worm fec protocol where they had a parasite challenge, fecal weed count, drench and repeat. And so what they looked at was the correlation between breeding values measured in different environments. And I realize we're in the South Island here, but I know the North Island breeders will agree that in the North Island, there is a parasite barber's pole worm or homonchus contortus. It's a blood sucker and it's a really big problem. It's not generally a parasite we have a problem with down here. So a lot of people in the North Island want to know that they are South Island rams that haven't had a barber's pole challenge or still be able to perform. This research showed that the correlation between the breeding values in all these different environments was quite good. So it was about, it was 0 0.7. That means that breeding values or fecal egg count measured in these different environments are largely independent of the flock sex or year in which they're measured. So resistance in one part of the country is going to work in other parts of the country as well. And Here's a slide that I actually already had before the question was just asked, is that there is an industry held view that there's a strong correlation between parasites and bags. Um, Natalie Pickering, who now works with Focus, did an entire PhD on this, and she looked at hundreds of thousands, so 130,000 pet records and 45,000 DAG records on animals throughout the country. And she looked at the genetic correlations. So Genetic correlation is when if you're breeding for one trait, there's under shared genes with another trait and it'll bring that along with it. But she showed on the right here, 
that it's sex and DAGs are very poorly genetically correlated, if at all, depending on the time when you take it. So if you're breeding for animals with reduced fetal egg count, that is not going to result in animals that are genetically more predisposed to DAGs. Um, and just to add as well on Robert's point, DAG score is actually quite highly heritable in terms of health traits. I think it's around about 0.4 from memory. So if you are going to start recording DAG score, you can make genetic gain because it's quite heritable quite quickly. So that is worm peak. Worm peak is your measure of resistance to parasites. But in SIL, we also have internal parasite resilience. And once again, Robert's already talked about this. It's defined as resilience to the effects of infection by maintaining production. And it's animals that grow as well as a drenched control mob. And animals are drenched if the weight falls below 80% of that control. So like I've already mentioned before, resilience is actually quite a tricky trait and therefore measuring it is really, really hard as well to measure it properly. So for example, at the moment for resilience, we're not actually measuring or utilizing fecal egg count on those animals. We're assuming that differences in performance are due to the parasite burden because as Robert said, the animals are drenched or not, but we actually don't know for sure. And we don't know what the burden of those lambs is. So you have to take that into account when you're thinking about resilience. I have to say, it's not necessarily an easy trait to measure. At the moment, we don't have a better way of doing it. So maybe someday. Um, and then finally, there's also CALA as well, which is a measure of parasite resistance. It's a saliva swab. So it's a lot easier and more palatable than a fecal egg count. And um, it's measuring the antibody response to ingested larvae from the sheep. So you can do this, drenching doesn't impact on it. So you can still continue to drench your animals because it's a response to the larvae as they come in. So at the moment, CALA data isn't used in the worm feet evaluation. So in that index. And that's because that, as I mentioned already, that worm feck economic index is based on eggs on pasture. So CALA research that's been done so far, um, we've found that CALA can be used to predict breeding values from FEC2, that autumn fecal egg count, but it's not a good, good predictor of FEC1. So at the moment for worm feck, CALA suggestion, suggestion using CALA will reduce fecal egg counts at about off the rate of well, a well-implemented FEC program. So at the moment, we still recommend if you want to make quick genetic gain to use fecal egg count. Cool. So in summary for breeding for parasites or selecting rams that are parasite resistant, you can breed for sheep which are resistant to parasites, which is a good thing. At the moment, fecal egg count is still a best proxy for parasite burden. And by using an index, which is DPF, on other traits. So you can select for animals that have, are good for growth, but also low fecal egg count. The benefits, like I mentioned, of a low fecal egg count does depend on your drenching strategy. If you're routinely drenching your animals, then you're probably not going to see as much many of the benefits as if you've reduced the drenching interval. Um, FEC is poorly genetically correlated with dagginess and resistance in one part of the country does actually work in other parts of the country. So where are we going next? I thought I'd just add a couple of slides on this in, in um, the pneumonia section around some of the research that's being done in this space. So there are a few different groups that are looking at using DNA to look at parasite species at the same time as fecal egg count. And also starting to look at the interaction between the fecal microbiome and parasites as well. Um, right, so next on to pneumonia. Um, pneumonia is a common disease of sheep in New Zealand. It's um, a complex interaction between host different pathogens in the environment. Uh, we have found that there's around about 30 to 40% incidence in lambs at slaughter on average, and that incidence is higher at the end of the season. I meant to change that back to New Zealand dollars. Sorry, I copied the slide from an international presentation, but the cost of respiratory disease was estimated to be around 20 to 50 million US dollars. Anyone can do quick maths? Millions of dollars to New Zealand. That was in 2008. 
Um, and that's primarily due to reduced growth and downgrading of carcasses at slaughter. I thought I'd pop this slide in. So Kathy Goodwin Ray did her thesis in Massey around risk factors for pneumonia. Um, so she identified risk factors for case farms as shearing lambs at weaning, breeding your replacements on farm, and contact with other flocks through purchase of lambs post weaning as well. So the, those case farms also had an increased percentage of lambs sold later in the season, but this was per, probably a consequence of pneumonia rather than a cause of pneumonia. Protect, protective factors included set stocking lambs post weaning and um, vitamin B12 at tailing and weaning as well. So essentially pneumonia, because as everybody knows with something like COVID or the flu comes from close contact, every time you're bringing animals in together, um, you're increasing the risk of transmission. The pneumonia project has been going for over 10 years now um, at Ag Research. And so we've developed an in-plant scoring system which can score lungs at chain speed. It's quite a simple um, zero, one, two measure. Zero where you have lungs with no lesions at all. Um, a one score is where there's less than 50% of any of the lobes are affected by consolidation. So that's where it's hard. Um, and as you can see on here, in the twos where more than 50% of any lobe is affected as it looks more like liver than lungs. So it's quite simple, zero, one, two. This is the data for the past um, from lambs born from in 2008, right through to the last crop of lambs. And as you can see over time, um, the average incidence is around 30% of lungs have some form of lesion on them at slaughter. Um, the dark line down here at about 0.7 is the pleurisy, and that is plant recorded pleurisy. So that's what you'll be getting back on your kill sheets. As you can see, there's quite a bit of variation. Um, this is from almost 16,000 records on pedigree recorded lambs from throughout the country. Well, oh, and if we go back, the low input lambs are scored for the first time this year, and they were quite high. They are the last. Well, it would help if I actually pressed that button. They are this bar here. So they were quite high, although interestingly, there weren't very many too. So there wasn't much severe pneumonia relatively, but there were quite a lot of lambs with a little bit of consolidation in their lungs as they came through. If we look at incidents by month of slaughter, the light green here is overall. So incidents of pneumonia. And as you can see, it's quite low in January and it increases. Um, most of our data is from March. We have 18 flocks of data here, which is why that's bigger. And then it tends to decrease later on in the season, although in May there's a wee bit of a spike. The darker green is the severe lesions. So as, as you can see, it's a bit lower, but there is a bit of a um, rise there as well. The main reason that we started scoring the lungs was we wanted to know is, is there any genetic component? So is it heritable? The, we've shown that the heritability of pneumonia consolidation in the lungs at slaughter is between seven and 16%. So it means you can breed for animals that are less susceptible to pneumonia. But we are also interested to look at, is it correlated with any other traits of interest? Like I mentioned before, if something's genetically correlated, if you select for one, you're going to bring the other one along for the ride. So found that there was a positive genetic correlation between pneumonia and fecal egg count, which was quite interesting. So that indicates that if we are breed, breeding for a reduced fecal egg count, we might be um, getting animals that are more resistant to pneumonia. This does need to be validated, though. And that's one of the reasons why we scored the um, low input lambs, because we need data on lambs that have both um, lung score and fecal egg count on them. Also of interest was the animals with lesions had actually grown more quickly between birth and weaning. And then they had grown more slowly between weaning and slaughter than animals without lesions. So as you can see here, this is average grams per day of with the pneumonia score of zero, one, and two over time, birth to weaning, weaning to pre-slaughter, birth to pre-slaughter, and carcass weight. So that means that animals that were, grew really quickly before weaning, at weaning, slowed down, and they were more likely to have severe pneumonia. 
So to summarize the work we've been doing in the ovine pneumonia space, we have managed to successfully develop this in-plant scoring system, and it is heritable, heritable this, um, the pneumonia lesion score. So it does mean we can make genetic gains through selective breeding, and there might be a genetic correlation with fecal egg count there, but we definitely need more data to validate. And as I'll mention later as well, that there is a bit of a confounding effect here because it might just be animals that had a higher worm burden are more susceptible to pneumonia because they've already been sick. So at, with multiple disease traits, it is hard to tease apart true genetic correlations. Where are we going to next with this project? So at the moment, trying to develop a way to detect this in live animals. Obviously, we've been looking at lungs and you can't breed from animals. Um, that have their lungs external to their bodies. So we're trying to figure out by scanning lambs prior to slaughter to see if we can get it correlated with lung score at slaughter so that we can start looking at live animals and roll this out to breeders. So just gathering the data at the moment, it looks like there is a bit of a correlation there. It's not perfect, but um, yeah, maybe watch this space essentially. Um, and finally, just briefly to touch on facial eczema, I know that most of you are probably from this part of the country, so this doesn't seem like a problem, but um, with climate change, it might become one, and it's always good to be aware. If we're talking about low input traits, um, having to treat animals for facial eczema is definitely not considered low input. So facial eczema is a metabolic disease. It's caused by ingestion of a toxin, sporodesmin, produced by a fungus, Mycetes chartarum. So this results in liver and bile duct damage and subclinical facial eczema um, can result in this liver damage and, and impact upon reproduction and production. And then clinical facial eczema is seen as photosensitivity. So the risk of facial eczema is associated with temperature, humidity and dead leaf matter. And like I mentioned, both clinical and subclinical facial eczema, um, you get impacts upon the animal. This is on the left um, is the pre-1999, the dark areas are where facial eczema was seen in New Zealand. And on the right is what is predicted with three degrees of climate warming. And I think most of the North Island guys in the room will be able to tell you um, that the um, areas that we see affected in here have actually been on hot in hot years, they've seen facial eczema. And it's been seen in the South Island as well. I think, so it is creeping down the country. At the moment, there are ways of treating facial eczema, including zinc boluses, but genetics is a viable option. Um, RAMGUARD is a commercial testing program that measure, gives animals a measured dose of sporodesmin, then looks at liver damage through a blood test for GGT, 21 days post um, dosing. And so there are about 60 client, RAMGUARD clients at the moment that are dosing up to 1,000 RAMs each year. The good thing is, is that tolerance to facial eczema is actually heritable in sheep. And for a disease trait, it's highly heritable, although we can, a uh, heritability of about 0 0.45 is considered moderate. So um, it was estimated using selection lines um, to be 0 0.45 and a few years ago, we re-estimated it using the RAMGUARD data set, um, which was 20,000 animals, and it was still 0 0.44, um, which is quite impressive that it was calculated using um, selection lines and still remain the same. Um, to note was when we looked at that larger data set, there was no significant genetic correlations between facial eczema tolerance and any of the production traits. So selecting tolerant animals isn't going to have any negative impacts on things like live weights or fleece weight. So that was just a brief touch on facial eczema. So to summarize, um, I just wanted to briefly talk about, because this is always a question, the correlations between the health traits. Like I mentioned, there might be one between um, lung score and um, fecal egg count, but we are looking into that further. There was also using fecal egg count selection lines, a positive genetic correlation between fecal egg count and GGT21, so that's facial eczema. But like I've said previously, when we're measuring these health traits concurrently, there are probably likely to be carryover effects. So coming back to that, if you have an animal that's had a really big 
challenge with a disease or a pathogen of any kind, and then you give it another one, it's probably not going to cope as well, regardless of the genetics of that animal. So it's just something to keep in mind. So to summarize the genomics and animal health space, we know that there are differences between sheep and their ability to resist disease. How genetic it is does depend on the disease. Um, but breeding is permanent and cumulative, so it's a pretty good tool. It also means that you can reduce your cost of treatment, start moving into that low input space, and it minimizes re reliance on chemical use and antibiotics. So that helps to address some consumer concerns about the amount of inputs in their animals. So overall, we want to be using genetics to breed healthier, more productive livestock. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you for that, Catherine. Um, we have one online that's come through whilst the floor might be thinking about a few others. Um, what is known about pneumonia and lifetime impact in ewes? For example, a high pneumonia year on ewe performance can lungs heal? And what about lesions in ewes at slaughter? So that's actually what, another one of the reasons that we're wanting to try get the ultrasound up and working. So at the moment, all of our data has come from lambs at slaughter, but we would like to be able to understand how pneumonia impacts upon our stock that we're keeping. So when is it developing? We, we think we know just from slaughter data, but when, how, when do these lesions appear? Do they resolve? How well do they resolve? And then we can start to look at if we can detect it in our ewes, we can start to look at the other impacts on the production of those animals as well. So um, hopefully being able to have a live animal measure will help answer some of those questions. Thanks. So Catherine, just a question. Uh, immune response in animals. So obviously you hear a lot in human health, the better your immune system is, the more responsive you are. Is there a common link between things like FEC, pneumonia, entropia, with the immune response in animals? With the immune response? Um, that's where I come back to those genetic correlations. If you just looked at the correlations, you would assume there was a common underlying response. Thinking about the immune system in general, probably not. I mean, a parasite is quite different too. So pneumonia can be caused by bacteria or mycoplasma or virus. So the immune system responds to a bacteria different in a different way than it responds to a parasite. Um, so there's probably not underlying similarities in the actual immune response itself, but there's potentially something there in the, how the animal, how quickly they will respond or whether they, um, like some of the work that's been done on resilience to parasites, for example, is that the animal's immune response just isn't, the animal just isn't really responding. So unlikely to be the actual same pathways, but it might be more to do with how the animal responds to a challenge in general. And I mean, we know already that the better fed an animal is, the, is, the better it can cope with disease. So there's, there is potentially some interactions, but it might just be if we pick one disease that we get some added benefits with the other diseases too, because the animal's not having to deal with parasites on top of everything else. Catherine, um, a question early on you had there on temperament, uh, behavioural thing. Um, some freezing works don't use dogs in their yards. We have about eight, eight to 10,000 lambing sheep. We don't use dogs in our yards at home. Um, it, considering that it alters, uh, considered that stress alters pH in, in meat. Um, and when you think about uh, perhaps inhaling dust uh, that that could add to your pneumonia problem one day just you know was just sort of bringing down tracks and those sort of things any thoughts on that oh yeah definitely like um I'm trying to I did try and find some research I mean anecdotally people will tell you that dusty yards um lead to pneumonia um couldn't find anything that had actually published in a scientific paper but if you think about it so one of the, the bacteria that's responsible for the lesions that um, you see in those pictures up there, that's what we call chronic non-progressive pneumonia. So acute pneumonia is when an animal gets sick and it dies. Um, but 
with these lambs, they had lesions in their lungs, but they were still alive. And so the bacteria that's responsible for that actually usually resides in the nasal passages of the sheep. It's only when it gets into the lungs that it causes a problem. And so things like open mouth panting definitely are going to, which is when you have um, like a running animals down the yard and they're down to the, the lane to the yards and all the rest. They are definitely going to, it makes sense that they would increase your risk of pneumonia. So I would agree with that. And actually, again, anecdotally, because a lot of the stuff I hear about pneumonia is anecdotally rather than through um, the literature for sheep anyway, is that um, some of the North, the North Island breeders have said that on really hot muggy nights, they tend to have, a um, few days later, they'll have more problems with pneumonia in their sheep as well, potentially again because of panting issues. But yeah, more research needs to be done. Essentially. Um, just uh, yeah, my question is, is there any, have you looked at the relationship between the actual um, genetic fat and muscle on the animal? Is there, you know, potentially more robust animal to uh, resist pneumonia, worms, whatever? No, um, we were actually just talking in the car on the way up that it would be quite interesting to start to look at um, even feed intake in some of these health traits as well. So at the moment, like in terms of genetics, we haven't looked yet at fat, but I mean, the animal, if you think about a sheep as a system and they're taking in so much grass, so much protein, and they can either put that into growth or they, they can put that into their immune system, it, it can make sense that there's going to be trade-offs. So the challenge for breeders is finding an animal that balances those two things enough. So if you just select on an animal that's resistant to disease, it might not grow as well. So um, breeding is always about finding a balance between things and there will definitely be a link between what an animal is putting into growth and fat deposition and all the rest and how well its immune system is responding. Um, who are we going to have first, you, Suzanne, or Trisha? Suzanne first? Okay. Um, all right, thanks, Catherine. Um, so hopefully when you arrived, you might have seen um, this somewhat spaceship-looking like thing outside, which for those who don't know is the pack trailer, where we measure um, methane of individual animals. Um, we've just completed, as Robert mentioned, uh, the second round of grass testing on this project's animals. Uh, this was the 2020 cohort. Um, so here to tell us a bit more about what the results of all that measurement means is Suzanne Rowe. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the invite. It's really nice to get out. Um, we spend far too much time in our offices. Kind of reminds you that you can breed for anything. I strongly believe that. Um, my first real lesson in genetics was um, during my ag degree. I went to uh, Zambia and I hand milked cows for a year. Um, and if you grow crops and you raise livestock in a really, really harsh environment, then you really see the impact of genetic differences. So we had Frisian cows that um, tried to die daily and we dipped every week. Uh, with really toxic chemicals. And we had zebu cattle that wandered around indifferent to ticks uh, and to, to all the challenges they faced. We had crops in the ground that um, if you got white ant, then the best you could do was pray for rain. So um, yeah, the, these challenges that, that um, have been faced, not only by management, by, but by genetics, um, the evidence is all around us that, that genetics is a, is a really strong uh, mitigation factor um, um, and probably another good example of, of, of genetics being used in, in the same way as, as we're looking at today is that during my postdoc uh, I was working with pigs and we were looking at boar taint and we were looking at boar taint because the EU decided to ban castration of piglets at, as day olds um, so uh, things like boar taint, skatol and androstenone became a huge problem overnight for a lot of people uh, it was worth a lot of money. And even though androstenone is, is part of the, the sexual reproduction pathway, um, it didn't matter. We could, we could still breed for it. So we could still breed animals that had good reproductive performance, but lowered their androstenone to the point that there was less taint and we could kill them uh, at the age that we wanted to, to, to basically make a profit. 
So um, I sort of see similarities all, all across the world in, in all the systems, and, and I'm pretty confident that, that we'll meet some of the challenges that, that we face, albeit it'll take time. And as someone said, that five to 10 year lag is really important. Um, I moved to New Zealand about eight years ago, and I'd been at AgriSearch about a year when I got called into uh, John McEwan's office, and he said, I want you to work on environmental traits. And I have to say, I rolled my eyes to the back of my head and pretty much said something like, isn't that for hippies and health and safety? Um, so apologies to everyone involved, because uh, I was wrong. Uh, and John pretty, pretty quickly put me straight. And actually, if we, if we look at methane as a trait, it's got a, oh, I don't want to go that far yet. Um, we can see that it has a, a really uh, strong physiological focus. So the animal takes in starch, uh, the, the rumen bugs digest it, and there's redundancy in that system. So there's, there's many different ways that you can ferment feed, uh, many different uh, volatile fatty acids that can be produced. And the end product, the animal, the growth that we see, the milk, the meat, is all, all, all down to that fermentation. Um, there's obviously some bypass proteins that we can look at and, and bypass starch, but in general, in, in ruminant production, we're really looking at that microbial fermentation. Um, and whilst it's going on, hydrogen is being given off, and that's got to go somewhere. Uh, and we have a, a very clever system where that hydrogen is bound up, and it's burped out as methane, um, and it's an ongoing process. And actually, we can, we can either breed the host or we can feed uh, to reduce the hydrogen coming off. We get things like more propionate, less hydrogen, and we get less methane. And it's relatively straightforward, uh, much more straightforward than, uh, than uh, I was led to believe in the first place. So um, why is it important in New Zealand? Why did I think coming from a European environment it wasn't important and then hit New Zealand and realize it was really important is that um, so much of our greenhouse gases come from enteric methane and we're on the hook for it. And the EU passed a motion not very long ago that says that if our environmental credentials don't match theirs, then they can put a trade tariff on, on, on what we send to them. So it's really important that, you know, that we show that we understand that uh, our production system does produce methane and we're doing something about it. So um, a decade on from, from the work that John started, uh, very insightful to start it as early as he did. And we have uh, methane selection lines. They're the only selection line in the world. Uh, they've been uh, bred for almost three generations now. And we've shown really successfully that if you breed high with high and low with low, that, that methane is certainly a genetic trait. Uh, it's heritable. And uh, we've very suc successfully uh, bred divergent lines that do indeed have different microbial fermentation. And the, the um, output of that, those microbial fermentations mean that, that we do have genetically different stock. Um, and, and we've looked at it in various ways and we've looked at it on lucerne and we've looked at it on pasture. We've grazed ram lambs all year and we've measured them in different seasons. Uh, and the upshot of this is that the lines are always different. And we've looked at maternal worth um, and the, the green line there is the, is the low methane animals and the, and the red line is the high methane animals. And in our selection lines, the lows are actually around about $12 higher in maternal worth than, than, than the highs. We don't flog that because we're not entirely sure whether there might not be a founder effect. These lines are only 100 ewes each. We only use four or five rams each year. Uh, we're pretty limited as to the lines. They're becoming quite inbred. Um, but the, the, I guess the, the take home message for that is that these low animals are healthy. They've been bred for three generations. Um, they're about six to 7% lower. Some of, the, some of the ram lambs in that low line are probably 20 to 25% lower than the average uh, in terms of, of methane, and they're perfectly healthy and, and they're running around without any problems. And we've measured them for everything we can possibly think of, which is a lot because we've got lots of tools and toys. Um, and and the, the general message is that we don't see a correlation uh, between methane really and any productive traits of note other than wool growth. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence to show that um, that the, the microbial fermentation is, is linked to, to wool growth and things like limiting factors like cysteine. So that, that's not a surprise. Uh, we see differences in, in fat um, and lean growth and the, the fatty acid profiles that come off of that fermentation 
the differences in acetate and propionate, those, those precursors actually change the, the fatty acid composition, composition of things like meat and, and, and milk. So, so we see that come through, um, but in terms of survival, uh, number of lambs, um, we don't actually see any, any big differences between, between the lines. So we're, we're pretty comfortable with what we're doing. And you will have seen the, the machine outside. So um, we started life using respiration chambers. The respiration chamber is the way to measure methane accurately. If you want an accurate measure of methane, you put an animal in a chamber, you leave it there for 48 hours and you measure all the gases that come off the animal. And there's no getting away from that. There's no, there's no getting around it. If you want an accurate measure, that's what you do. Uh, it's very expensive, costs us about $1,000 an animal. Uh, so it's not much good for breeding because we need a lot more information than that. Uh, so we moved to uh, a proxy, which is the, the portable accumulation chamber. Uh, we started off with um, one hour in the chamber and then an hour two weeks later because it's repeatable. So we got more information. And we've just now dropped to uh, only one measure for non-research animals. Um, because we're, we're reasonably confident with the data that we've got that we can do that. Um, but the, the portable accumulation chamber really changed the environment. Uh, it meant that we could measure many, many animals, thousands of animals, in fact. It meant we could look at a lot more traits. Um, and eventually, it meant that we could actually um, put, put it on wheels uh, and, and use it ar around the country, uh, use it in different environments, use it on different farms. So uh, for us, it's been a bit of a, a revolution. Uh, the Australians invented it, I'm sad to say. We can't claim it. Um, but, but our version is certainly superior to theirs. Um, this is about version three. And um, we've exported uh, a unit to Norway. There's about 3,000 Norwegian sheep that have been measured. We've uh, exported a unit to Ireland. We've just sold two to the UK. Uh, we're in the process of exporting one to China. Uh, so um, throughout all the projects throughout the world, this this technology really seems to be taking hold. And that's great for us because we've got all the Norwegian data and we've converted it to ours and the genetic parameters and the heritabilities are almost bang on the same. So that's a real comfort to us that we're seeing the same genetic variation uh, in different populations across the world because that gives us faith that what we're measuring is actually accurate and it's comparable across systems, which of course for breeding is, is what we need. And you all have seen it outside. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do because you guys get a magic breeding value and, and it comes in grams per day, um, but, but that's not what we start with. So uh, we start with um, firstly some, some calibration. So we have some, some gases that we calibrate and, and we record that. And we look at carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen and, and methane. Uh, and for each lot, we have the, the time that the animals come in. We need the temperature. And we need the atmospheric pressure. Um, and, and so we record over the day. So, so we record chamber, uh, parts per million for the gases, uh, and, and obviously animal numbers. We need the weight of the animal. Um, and that's because when it comes to actually um, deriving the gas traits uh, to derive uh, the, the liters per day and, and eventually grams per day, we need the time that we measured the start and the end time. We need the weight of the animal because we subtract it from the, the volume of the, the container that, that he or she is in. Uh, we need temperature and pressure because in order to actually work out all those um, or derivations, we need to know exactly what the temperature is and, and what the pressure is of the gas in order to come up with grams per day. Uh, and we also sometimes convert to moles. So um, happy to talk till I'm blue in the face with, with any of you about that. Um, at, at, at any point, but just to kind of let you know that, um, you know, that the parts per million that we measure with the Eagle analyzer on the, on the trailer, there's a little bit of conversion behind it to, to get to the, the grams per day that, that you guys eventually see. Uh, and we scale the data. So um, because every lot is different, um, methane is, is, has diurnal variation. So uh, there's more in the morning, uh, there's a lot more variation around eating. Uh, it goes up and down. Um, there's, there's basically variation across the day. So what we need to do is make sure that every lot is measured exactly when they come in, how long they've been off feed, and then we scale within each group that's measured. So that means that animals are compared with their contemporary 
within the lot that they're measured and, and it's scaled to an overall mean. And the mean at the moment is, is a hogget mean of uh, seven and a half grams uh, or, or with adults, we, we scale to 13. But generally at the moment, we're using that, that hogget mean as a, as a scaling factor. So the data is a little bit complex. It's not too bad. We've been uh, working with it for a while now and we're, and we're reasonably comfortable with it. Um, and and we've, got, we've gathered a lot of data across many research flocks. We've got uh, research breeding values. We've got commercial breeding values. We've got correlations with traits. Um, but it's actually really exciting for this to all culminate in breeding values coming out of SIL. And that's probably the most powerful thing that we have is that all, the, all this data has been um, brought together into, into a single system. And, and we're getting the benefit of all those thousands of measures that research funds have paid for are actually underpinning a commercial system. And it doesn't always work like that. I know it should, but it doesn't always. And here's your breeding value, your PAC CH4. Now, the BV that you're seeing is, is, a, is an absolute methane emissions. And we probably get asked on a daily basis why we're not selling methane yield. And we started with methane yield, and that's the amount of methane emitted per unit of feed eaten. And if you just bred below methane, you just breed a small sheep, because it's pretty obvious that methane is completely uh, correlated with the amount of feed eaten. Um, the reason that we have decided to uh, go with uh, an absolute methane emissions breeding value is that we want it in the index. Um, and the index already accounts for feed eaten. Um, and, and in an ideal world, it would actually have uh, you know, feed, feed intake in the index itself. So for it to be something that's useful and something that can be combined into an index, uh, we decided that it would need to be an absolute emissions trait and, and not some ratio um, which, which would cause problems further down the track. So it's basically uh, future-proofing the work. Um, this is a, a, a centile table that was produced at the end of 2018 uh, for the first sort of eight to 10 flocks that, that use the data. Um, and you can see uh, the, the, the pack column is at the end. So you've got pack CH4 and pack CO2. We're not using CO2 yet. CO2 is potentially an indicator of metabolic rate, which is potentially an indicator of feed intake, but we haven't found a way to handle the trait yet. That gives us really accurate predictions of feed intake. So um, physiologically, it makes sense that we should be able to use it. We haven't managed to do it yet. Um, so uh, it's, it's a work in progress. So you'll see CO2 come out and, and you'll probably wonder why it's not been used. And that's just because we haven't really got a handle on how to model it yet to use it effectively. It's not accurate enough. We don't trust it enough yet. Um, but you'll see there that um, in the centiles for PAC CH4, that it runs from minus 0.88 grams a day to, to plus 0.93. So actually a really decent amount of variation uh, seen across uh, most flocks that we measure. Um, this is actually the, the low input. Um, there's a, a, a methane BV here in, in grams per day. So um, you can see there's a big variation in those orange bars. Some are very low, some are very high, uh, but the, the take home message is there's a lot of variation. So once there's variation, of course we can select. So that's really exciting. Um, we don't really mind what the numbers are at the moment because we're assaying what's on the ground. What we know is that we've got numbers that we can choose from and we, and we can select to go down. And the blue line is just the average live weight of the offspring of each of those rams, just to show that it's not just a live weight thing. Um, it's not just that, you know, they've got small offspring, so, so they've got low methane. Um, and I've, I've, I've covered up these flocks, but it's pretty easy to see the... Uh, research flock, so this is methane and methane yield. Um, the one in the middle with a the, with the huge amount of variation is flock 3633, that's the methane selection lines. Um, lots of variance there, as, as, uh, as you'd hope and expect. Uh, the one to the, the far left is, is 4640, so that's the South Island progeny test, and they've been measuring for a while. And the one two in is, is, is flock 2638. And we've actually uh, started to select flock 2638 using an index that includes methane. Um, because we realize that the selection lines have, have limited life. Uh, they're they're going to get very inbred very soon, and they're great for looking at the physiology, uh, but we really want to know what happens in real life. So uh, Flock 2638, uh, Coopworth Flock, uh, we've been uh, adding methane to the index, and our prediction two years ago was that in a generation of selection, we would see a physical change in methane of minus 3.7%, 
We're two years on, we haven't seen any drop in genetic progress in the other traits, uh, and we've seen a 2% reduction in methane. So we're well on track to hit the, the physical target that we thought we would hit, uh, given the level of selection. Then we're selecting quite heavily on methane. We've chosen to uh, value carbon at $100 a tonne. The current value of carbon is $38 a tonne. Um, and if I was to advise anyone to go home tonight and uh, add it to their index, I'd, I'd probably be picking around 50, uh, if I'm honest. Uh, but as I say, we haven't seen um, a drop yet in, in genetic progress in, in 2638 by value at $100 a tonne. That basically means for us, once we scale it uh, by, by a U and add followers and, and, and all, all the rest of that malarkey, that it comes out about $6.50 a gram. So if I have a breeding value of, of minus one gram of, of methane, then, then I can add $6.50 to my index. Um, it was pretty scary, the first couple of matings, wondering what the hell we were doing. But in actual fact, if I rank my rams by maternal worth, I tend to pick my third choice. I don't pick the bottom of the list. Um, so um, for most people, I think what, what we'll be doing for a while is just ranking by performance and then looking at the methane breeding values and not picking anything that's, that's super high. Um, but we've certainly seen success. We've been banding some numbers around, looking at what the impact might be. We all know that we're supposed to be hitting targets for the government. So um, uh, mostly John McEwen, but, but, but together we put together some figures and we looked at what would happen if, if methane was started to be uh, taken up now. And we hit the ground in about five or six years time. And we started to see around about a half percent uh, change per annum in the industry. That would be a 1.7% methane reduction by 2030, given that nothing would happen before 2023. Um, and we're looking at 150,000 tons of, of, of methane. Um, and, and by 2040, we'd be looking at around 24 and a half million uh, at $38 a ton. So um, if we got there by measuring 5,000 animals a year um, and, and genotyping them, so assuming that we, we would basically measure all the key size in, in the industry and genotype them, then we'd be seeing an internal rate of return of around 77% uh, with a net present value of 10%. So, so the numbers add up, actually. Uh, it's, it, it, it makes sense to, to, to measure and to phenotype. Uh, we haven't yet factored in whether there will be slower prog progression in other traits by adding an additional trait to the, the selection index. Obviously, we need to look at uh, selection intensity and, uh, and what will happen when we do that. Um, uh, that's for modeling on, on another day. Um, but, yep, 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 I'm nearly finished. So, but in, in terms of, uh, of rollout, um, basically what it looks like is uh, finding a way to, to measure enough animals that we have a representative sample across the country and then using uh, something like genomic prediction to roll it out to the, the remaining connected flocks um, and, and looking at the heritability of the trait, we need at least 10,000 animals that are genotyped and phenotyped. Um, and the PGGRC have uh, come on board. So we've been really well supported by government for the last 10 years, uh, both the NZAGRC, uh, MPI and industry. Uh, so industry supporting the PGGRC and PGGRC putting in funders into, funding into this. And they've been funding about two and a half thousand measures a year, uh, as providing those measures are representative, representative of the national flock uh, and, and their genotypes. So they provided this industry support package to really get this thing going, to get this moving from research out into the commercial environment, which is a, can be a real stumbling block. Um, and, and we're doing really well. So uh, that's what the numbers look like. So to date, we've measured 8,123 animals through PAC. Uh, we've got 1,354 signed up this year, uh, so by the end of this year, we'll we'll have we'll be hitting at least that 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 ten thousand mark. So now it really becomes about measuring enough animals and enough flocks that we really get genetic connectedness, uh, and we can start to think about putting an economic weight and getting it in the index. Um, and and globally, as I say, every, everyone's basically jumping on the bandwagon. Uh, the top measures or the top chambers, those glass boxes, are in Uruguay where they don't have a lot of infrastructure. Uh, and, and down here in the bottom left, this is Norway, and they've got a heated truck with a coffee machine. So um, typical Scandinavia, um, doing it well, but essentially in that truck is, is, is the same mechanism as you'll, as you'll see outside. Um, and as I say, they're measuring 3,000 sheep over a couple of years. 
Um, and I was just going to finish up by saying that uh, the RFI picture is a little bit tricky. Uh, it looks to us as though the low methane animals are slightly less efficient uh, than their high uh, emitting counterparts, but they also have more lean muscle and different fatty acid profiles in their meat. So the jury's a bit out at the moment, actually. Uh, that, that picture needs to be uh, clarified. Um, uh, and the same with milk, we see different fatty acid profiles in the milk. And finally, microbiomes. We've been collecting rumen samples from thousands of animals that we measure on the pack. And actually a rumen sample is uh, predictive not only of methane, but of feed efficiency. And we've come up with a way of taking uh, genotypes and microbial sequence, adding it together and getting a, a sort of holistic breeding value on, on the animal that comes not only from the host DNA, but also the microbial DNA that it harbors. So a bit, bit more of a whole picture. Um, and if that's not hippie, I don't know what is, but it's, again, it seems to be working. So um, I'll just finish up by, yeah, again, another, another plug for breeding. Um, and uh, yeah, next steps are getting that genomic prediction running really well, getting the microbial prediction running to a point where perhaps we can roll up and take room and samples and set up pack measures. Uh, and looking at milk and meat fatty acid differences and, and additivity of strategies. So that there are other ways to, to skin this cat. There are other ways to reduce methane. We can feed, we have inoculants, we have additives, we have vaccines. Uh, we we want to know how that combines with, with, our, with our breeding strategy. You know, we just, we just want to get the job right. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll do whatever we need to. And of course, all the, all the great people that sit behind desks and uh, fund us, for which we wouldn't be here without it. So sorry, I've, I've talked for too long. It's a, it's a, it's a trait, it's probably genetic. <laughs> Thank you, um, Suzanne. Um, just a question for the group. Uh, who has done pack testing so far? Uh, half a dozen of you. How many of you are thinking about doing it? Not yet, a couple more, that's cool. Um, if I were an interested breeder, where would I find out more about doing it? So um, there's, a, there's a website, www.methanebb.com. David? Co.nz, Co.nz, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so David has put together a, a website, and if you go on there, there's a form you can fill out to show interest, uh, and then uh, Neville Amy's probably will contact you, and if that conversation goes well, then Barry will contact you, and then at some point agreed in the future, that thing will rumble up your drive, uh, and uh, yeah, your day will be thoroughly disrupted. Um, if you can't find the website, then you can contact pretty much anyone in Beef and Lamb, or myself, or Barry, or Wendy, or Trish, any, 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 any one of us. And uh, yeah, eventually it'll rumble up your drive and disrupt your day. So uh, just, just let us know if you're interested. Thanks for that, Suzanne. Uh, do we have any questions from the group? Uh, oh. Yeah. yeah um, as breeders start to measure it, will you open up your your um, high and low lines to outside size to really push, see how far you can take it? I think it's more likely that we'll pick them out of flock 2638. So we always use a low methane sire from the lines in 2638. And I think it's more likely that that's where the sort of multiplication of the low methane size will come from. Um, I, I suspect the lines over time will get inbred and, and, and too far away from all the other maternal worth traits. We don't select them for anything but methane yield. That's it. That's the only thing they're selected on. So I, I, think, I think I'd be a bit cautious about that, uh, but potentially. Uh, a little bit off topic, back to your introduction. Um, for those farmers that don't dock tails, they obviously don't castrate male lambs either. On boar tank, is there any work being done on ram tank? I don't actually know. It? I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. Uh, somebody might know. I'm not somebody that I'm aware of at the moment. No, Trisha says no. So I suspect they killed you. I suspect they killed young enough that it's not a problem. Uh, generally, it's about the, the age or the size of it that you kill them at that, that makes a big difference. Now you have to ask a question up here, so he has to run back. Let's see how, much, how how we can make him run. 
Um, I'm just wondering, how does it alter wool? You mentioned wool. Uh, how's that affect it? So, um, fleece weight, uh, so certainly um, maternal fleece weight is, is higher, uh, the lower the methane. So, um, I think that's probably something to do with the, the fermentation um, in, in the gut. It's, it's producing some, something that's limiting and, and that's boosting wool growth. I spoke to a guy called Hutton Oddie. He works at University of, of New England in, in Australia. And he said that the relationship between the gut microbiome and merinos has been known for ages. He may just be being a know-it-all, but um, yeah, he, he basically said we should have known this already. So. Um, we know that we've been reducing emissions intensity by about a percent a year for the last 30 years or so. Um, and so this selecting just on methane is going to make about the same amount of progress. So why don't we just keep doing what we're doing rather than actually selecting on methane? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a good question. Um, and basically the, the targets that we have are absolute methane emissions. So, um, you know, we could just go faster and, and produce more and say, well, in terms of intensity, we've lowered our emissions per unit of product. but the answer is, is that the government, on, it's not acceptable to um, the, the global community. They want absolute emissions lowered. And, and no, it, it won't do it just by itself. But by being more productive, we run less. We, we run half as many sheep as we, we did 30 years ago. Yeah, so absolutely. we have reduced absolute emissions. Absolutely, at the yeah, same time. In, in, entirely. So in terms of um, reducing stock units, then definitely. But... If you think about the fact that um, methane is linked to the amount of feed that's eaten, uh, not the, the number of animals in, in the paddock, if those animals are bigger and eating more and consuming more and producing more, then you might find that you're still producing the same amount of methane. So we still have to work on reducing methane per unit of feed eaten, as well as um, reducing the number of stock units. Um, just adding on to that, I was at the Ag Innovation Day this week in Palmerston, saw your, um, uh, the beef and lamb new tool for doing methane reduction and what we've got to do for the farms. But in that modelling that beef and lamb have done, they're sticking with the standard stock unit as opposed to allowing us to um, breed towards low methane, smaller animals, etc. How come we're sort of not going to get our tools that we're breeding into a measurable tool? So we're, we're, we're really pushing that through uh, Hewaka Ekanoa and through MPI, uh, and we have a few advocates there, and we've pushed it for the climate change and, and through beef and lamb and, 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 and all, all the different calculators, and, and that's one thing that we're really pushing hard, and you're absolutely right. If we don't get this into the tools and there's no metric that we can measure by, then, you know, we're, we're going to fall over. But um, that conversation has not been, it, well, that decision has not been made at, at government level because um, we're, we, we're sort of part of the conversation and, and we're pushing really hard for it because that's where all this research has been heading for a long time. And government are behind us because, you know, they, they funded it. Yeah, thanks. Um, look, thank you. I mean, the, the work you're doing is just, you know, fantastic. Um, I just wanted to, to flesh out again that, that comment made about the beef and lamb tool that we've more recently developed to measure um, on-farm methane. And I just would really encourage farmers to, to get on board and have a look at that. It's, it's for those of you, um, our farm, we've been for a number of years now working through Overseer, and so we could see our number there. But this is so much easier to use. Um, it, it really is. So it's, it's still a bit crude, and I take your comment about the stock unit, and that's something we've, you know, we're, we're talking about, and, and we know it on, over time it will continue to evolve, but it's a really good start. Um, I think Rob said right at the start of the day, you know, if, if, if you're going to achieve something, you've got to know where you start from. So it's a starting point. So um, it would be great to see farmers um, have a look at that tool and, and use it. Perhaps you could promise to put genetics in it. So we've absolutely left a spot there where those formula can go in. As soon as we've got the maths figured out, um, we've, we've made sure that the, those other mitigations as they come along, whether it's um, genetics or other things that people can count for, um, we, like yourselves, working really hard to make sure that the people doing the maths and, and, and working on the calculators understand that when people have got mitigations, that they can claim value from them. So all part of a big, big conversation, absolutely. 
Okay. Just a further point, and I realize that a lot of the audience here is South Island, of course, but in terms of facial eczema, the prevalence studies that have been done show minimally a 20% reduction in performance. You know, profitability performance is, is impacted significantly by subclinical eczema. We remove eczema from the equation, we can run 20% less stock and have the same performance. So it, what the work we're doing with the methane and stuff is valid and it's really good and it's interesting and we're all gonna get on board, but let's not work in complete silos when we've got other production limiting diseases that we need to make sure we target funding and that we get some answers and some solutions and some tools because that is part of the answer as well. And you know, it's great to hear that you've had the funding and you've had all this support the group of facial eczema breeders here, you know, it brings a tear to our eye because we have been screaming and banging and asking for support and research tools and alternative tests for years and years and years. And it's coming, but you know, as an industry, we all need to be asking for all these tools and there's only yeah. a limited bit of money, but- I, I, um, I, I feel your pain. Uh, so uh, we probably ask for money 10 times uh, each, each, each time we get a cent. Uh, so yeah, I certainly feel your pain. And uh, every year the NZAGRC asks me for a list of desirables. And I can tell you that every single year, facial eczema has been on it. So uh, I'm buying the same drum. And, you know, we absolutely, we, we work in systems, biological systems. So, so completely agree. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough fiscal environment. Same, the same is true for the pneumonia stuff, right? That um, Catherine was talking about earlier as well in terms of those production on farms. Completely. Thanks. That's, um, that's our question time. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, Suzanne will be here um, for the remainder of the afternoon if you've got any more questions. Um, so as it was alluded to by both Robert and Suzanne, um, we have had um, animals from this progeny test um, sent to Invermay to the residual feed intake unit. And um, this was a portion of the same animals that have been pack tested here on farm. Um, so to tell us a bit more about those results is Trisha. Trisha. Cool. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I realise I'm the last speaker probably before a cup of tea, so hopefully everybody can stay seated for another 20 minutes or so just while I talk you through some of the feed efficiency work that we have been doing. I want to start off before I even go on to my next slide is some of you will be sitting here and you'll have just heard the word efficiency and you'll be thinking about all the different types of efficiency that we can talk about. And last night I was at dinner with a few of you and we were talking about your efficiency as being the weight of lamb weaned per kilo of you mated. There are many different types of efficiency and they are all valid and have their place in our thought processes as we think to how we can start to achieve some of these methane targets and how we can actually improve our productivity. But the trait that I'm going to be talking today about is a very specific one, and that is feed efficiency. And so the concept behind feed efficiency is you can have two animals, and the question is, do those two animals who may be growing at the same rate and approximately the same live weight, do they eat the same amount of feed? And the answer is more than likely not. And I can think of a whole lot of my, between my friends and my family to look at the variation that I can see between who is nice and trim but can eat forever, like my brother, and others like myself who struggle with everything. So there is definitely, everybody can kind of think in their own lives about an example that can relate to this concept of feed efficiency. And so the way that we look at feed efficiency, and if you look at the literature, there are many, many different ways, again, that feed efficiency can be assessed. The one that we've been looking at is residual feed intake. And so that is looking at the amount of feed that an animal is actually eating versus what we've predicted it should be eating for its live weight and its growth rate. So everybody in the audience will also be sitting here thinking, well, you're starting to put up a slide here where you've got things undercover and we've heard already that we're feeding them on lucerne pellets. That isn't what my animals are grazing out um, in the paddock. Um, but we have done a lot of preliminary work to be able to establish that what we can achieve and look at in this feed intake facility is relevant to an on-farm production system in many ways. And the reality is we're wanting to know exactly how much an individual animal is eating. 
I'll touch on it briefly at the end, and Suzanne touched on it briefly around trying to think of traits like CO2 or something to be able to actually get our intake at pasture. But at the moment, we have no ability to actually be able to measure that. And so the way that we do it is to be able to bring the animals into this feed intake facility. So a few of you uh, have been down to Invermay, and I have an open invitation to anybody who happens to be traveling through Mosgiel in July or August this year to, to pop out, because we will be having animals in, come up and have a look at the feed intake facility that we have. So we established a feed intake facility at Invermay in 2015. It is based on, it's based on these um, feed intake machines here. And we'll have a couple of slides where you can see the animals eating them in, in a little bit. But we have 20 of these feeders that are in just, they're just within the sheep yards and our top yards at Invermay. And so we have 10 down one side and 10 down the other. Each one of these has a, uh, you can just see here where the animals can put their heads in. And they have a load cell with the loose end pellets um, sitting in there. And those load cells measure in real time how much the animals are actually eating. It's all linked up with the RFIDs in their ears, so we know exactly when they've gone in, how much they've been eating, and how long they've been in there for. And so between 2015 and 2018, Beef and Lamb Genetics funded what was New Zealand's first, and, and in many ways one of the world's first largest data sets to be able to look at feed efficiency in sheep. So we measured nearly 1,000 animals from the the 4640, the beef and lamb genetics progeny tests, and Suzanne's mentioned plots, the, the methane selection lines and plot 2638. Between those, over three years, we put 1,000 animals through the feed intake um, facility, and we were able to see a 22% difference in the extreme animals in terms of how much feed they were eating for their live weight and growth rate. And I'll take you through some examples of this soon, but that piece of work, um, established that the heritability of this feed efficiency trait was 0.42. So it's, it's debatable, I've got high, very high here. Catherine was mentioning um, that some of her traits, she was saying 0.4 is a kind of moderate, but certainly anything that's kind of above that 0.4 mark is something where we definitely have um, a strong genetic component to that trait that can be selected on and progress made. And so as we've heard, the low input progeny test, um, one of the things about this is that kind of environmental impact. And if we think about feed intake, feed intake is going to have its role not only in that methane production aspect, but it's also a number of farmers in this room. Um, my husband's a farmer and we've been started feeding out for the season already this year. Feed is a limiting factor in every single farming operation in New Zealand. And in some years it is far worse like this year than other years. But feed has a real cost. Even in a year where there is a lot of feed, feed still has a cost to that system. And so if we can be identifying those kind of animals and those kind of genetics that can require less feed for their production outcomes, then how we use that information and how we would use those animals, whether you would simply just have the same amount of animals that they would be eating less, or you would look to increase your stocking rate. There are a number of ways that that information could be used, but until we start to look at this trait and understand it, we can't really start to capitalise on it. And so that is why, as part of the low input progeny test, it has been identified as a trait of interest. And so the born 2019 cohort, we had um, 160, 170 of those lambs came down to Invermay at the start of July last year. This was them when they first arrived. So compared to the other slide that I had before, we have up these little barriers and we've taken out some of the gates, just trying to get the animals, putting their heads in and actually eating the loose end pellets. So what we do to generate data to estimate this feed efficiency or this residual feed intake is that we take at any one time, we can put 160 to 200 lambs into that feed intake facility. We can take them at any age, but just how things have been working out, like with the low input progeny test at the moment, the teasers are out with them. So we don't really want them to be down at Invermay at the moment. So we look to target kind of a July measurement period for those. And so they get trucked to Invermay. And one of the first things we do is we get the ultrasound scanner to come in and take a back fitness on them and also eye muscle area. 
And we've heard a number of times coming up today, how does body composition impact on this or how does body composition impact on that? Body composition is a really critical trait when we start thinking about a whole lot of these things. And so getting that body composition information is really important. Ultrasound is a pretty crude in terms of what I would really like. And we did have the first in the, that larger data set of 1,000 animals. We did have 600 of them go through the CT scanner at Inverme, and that's given us some really awesome results. But unfortunately, we can't put all of them through the CT scanner. But so we, we CT scan them at the start and the end for fatness and, and eye muscle traits. They are weighed twice weekly on a Monday and a Thursday. We have them in the facility for 14 days. We've heard talk already today about some feeds you need an adjustment period. So Lucerne is one of those. And so we do have the ability to offer the animals other types of feed just in that first 14 days while we introduce them. Most of them are really good. Um, some are very stubborn. And I've got a slide in a minute talking about the stubbornness last year of, of one lot of lambs. Um, but so we managed to get through nearly every single animal. We'll get through that first 14 days and be very happy eating those lucerne paddock pellets out of that feed intake facility. We then go on and measure feed intake for 42 days in that facility to get a really good handle on intake, but also growth rate. It's actually pretty easy to get the intake. It's, it's actually a pretty stable trait. There's definitely day to day, and because we work on just assigning it to a 24 hour period, sometimes I'll have had a big feed just before midnight, just after midnight, that can change day to day. But overall, it's very consistent for an individual animal. But it's actually really hard to get that really true good live weight gain profile. And I'll show you in a minute about that. So last year, um, a lot of the results that I'm going to be talking about now are very specifically for the group 170 that came down from Arari Gorge last year. Um, our farm manager, Kevin Nola, he's been involved in every single cohort that we've had go through over the last five years or so. And I've never seen him tear his hair out like he did last year with, with this group of animals that came down. We had a real stubborn bunch of just over 10 animals who really um, didn't, didn't particularly want to put their head in or didn't particularly want to be eating the pellets even out of buckets. Um, and after about a week of struggling with these, I went and finally looked at, at who they belonged to. And actually, most of them belong to one sire. And it is a sire that is kind of unique within the progeny test last year and we do actually think that it has a tendency for fussy eating and so or some, something about it is just a little bit different and it was just so stand out last year in terms of how how bad and how difficult it was to get the progeny from that particular sire to adjust to the facility and so the irony was once we got, we ended up getting eight of the ten from that sire to eventually eat in the feed intake facility. And once they were convinced that those pellets weren't going to kill them, they actually did really well on them. But it was just a really interesting concept to see these behavioural differences coming through in these first cross progeny. I'd have really loved to have been able to follow them back up here. Catherine talked about the GPS collar work that we do. Loved to have been able to look at some of that, but we just didn't, didn't get the thing, everything lined up to be able to do that. But so for every other sire, most of them um, were quite happily eating over 1,000 grams of the pellets by the time that 14-day period was up. I talked about the importance of getting all of that live weight data over that 42-day period. These are all the data points of um, when, when we were weighing them. We were weighing them at 9 a.m. every Monday and every Thursday. There wasn't any real deviation, but you can see and you'd think that there was some deviation because there's kind of a pattern there. But it just really shows that even though you think you're weighing them at a consistent time, things have happened that actually any two successive live weights, we could have looked at those two and see that they were actually, they'd lost a little bit of live weight, but then the next one had actually gained quite a bit more. And so it's actually about being able to develop the full relationship over that 40 day to 42 day period to get the growth rates and take out all of the noise of individual measurements. So this is the summary of the time in the facility for those 170 odd animals. So I talked about having um, those ultrasound measurements taken at the start and the end. We, they started with an average of 2.5 mils of fat. Um, by the end of their time there, they averaged five mils of fat. And it kind of skips down. I probably should have these in a slightly different order. 
This is kind of supported by the fact that they actually grew on average 343 grams a day while they were in the facility. So Robert was talking earlier that the industry average is about 100 grams under normal New Zealand conditions. In this type of situation where they were eating those lucerne pellets and, and really feed, they were on true, true ad lib feeding, we were averaging 343 grams a day. Um, lowest was 148, one um, absolute, I don't know, gorgeous rock star, I don't know what we want to call it, um, was averaging 535 grams a day while they were in the facility. Um, so it just shows you what the impact of actually having them in that environment where there is true ad lib feeding um, can actually happen. We, ironically though, despite all of the things that we're saying that they all grew really well, is there were some animals that didn't actually put on any fatness during that period and some that obviously put on a lot of fat. So they started just on that 40 kilo mark and by the time they'd left um, eight weeks later, two weeks in production and six weeks in the trial, they were averaging 57 kilos. So they came back a bit different to those that had stayed behind. Um, in terms of the mid-trial live weight, they were sitting around that 50 kilo mark. And on average, they were eating about two and a half kilos or just under two and a half kilos of these lucerne pellets. But this is looking at the between animal variation. This is what residual feed intake is. These animals all here had very similar um, mid-trial live weight. So just around that 50 kilo mark, they were all growing at around, what's the lowest there, 327 to 370 grams a day. So all growing quite well, but not a lot of variation there in those numbers. But we have an animal here who, for those production metrics, was only eating just over two kilos of feed a day. So this was the most efficient one here, right there. So she was eating just over two kilos of feed. And so the green is the most efficient and it's kind of color scaled to being the red being the most, the least efficient. And so this animal down here was the least efficient and she was eating nearly two and a half kilos of pellets. So that was half a kilo difference in feed between those are, those are individual extremes, but it's just giving you a feel to the type of variation that we're actually talking about in this trait. So that's half a kilo difference in feed per day. And from the work that we knew previously, we knew that this was a highly heritable trait, that there is definitely significant variation between sires. And so this is just an information summarizing um, the, the live weight. And this is a sire deviation. They're not true breeding values because I didn't want to be confusing. Um, I, I can incorporate all of the pedigree information, but I just didn't want to be confusing things when we already have live weight and fat traits and so I didn't want breeders to be directly trying to compare those. So I've just kept them as, as sire deviations for now. But we can see that we had a sire in here um, that was significantly lighter throughout the trial and one that was significantly heavier. So kind of the orange ones are significantly worse and the bluey greens are significantly better for that trait. Um, and then over here we can see, sorry, I'm not using this very well. The, um, the fat depth one, we definitely had a sire who was significantly fatter throughout the whole trial. Um, we had one that was significantly skinnier through the whole trial in terms of back fat thickness. But we had a couple of sires who kind of changed how they were based on how much fat they laid down during that time period. And then the final trait there is this, this residual feed intake trait. And so we had um, those numbers there are quite a lot smaller, but it is the way the, the deviations work out, but they were still very significant in terms of one, the sire there up in the orange, sorry, of, of a very efficient sire. So that's the one down there in the blue that those progeny were eating significantly less per day. And then the, um, the orange one up there that those progeny were eating significantly more per day. And this is just taking those top and bottom sires and just showing that this is a trait that's independent of live weight. It, it takes into account those live weight differences. And so the sire there and the, the blue being the low sire. And so those progeny, they were all different live weights, but they were consistently eating less than the equivalent progeny from that sire, the, the high sire there or the sire that wasn't very efficient. There's of course, and genetics is never perfect. There's a little bit of overlap there with a couple of the individual animals but it clearly shows that there's significant differences between those animals. 
One of the things about all of this information that we can collect out of these feed intake facility machines is we get a bunch of feeding behavior tracked data. Exactly what this all means, we're trying to work out, but um, we are looking at links through to, to the methane side of things around frequency of grazing. But the really interesting thing about it is that some of these traits were very heritable. So one of the, the feeding behavior traits has a heritability of 0.6 or 0.7. And so the way that these animals were behaving and eating in this facility from the moment they arrived was very repeatable across the time that they were in the facility. This example here is around the rate at which they were eating. So here we have an example of an animal that had a high feeding rate. So if it was in that feeder for a thousand seconds, it was eating about 600 grams of feed. And it didn't matter how long it was actually in the feeder for, it was eating at that high rate. And you can see that relationship there. Whereas we move over here to this animal, and it was an example of a, a low rate intake. So if we look at the same point there at a thousand seconds, it was only eating about 200 grams of feed. And I really think about this, the relevance of these traits we're still trying to work through. But when I think about, we open a new break at home. If you have the ability of animals to actually go in and absolutely gorge and eat really fast and make the most of that feed that's in front of them, versus those that go in and prefer to have a very different grazing behavior, what are the implications of that? Don't know the answers, but I just think there's a lot of information to be found in this type of, of data. We also had, um, so in each one of these graphs, it's two individual animals. The number of times that they would go to those feeders, on one lot of them, we had um, one animal there. Across the 42 days, it was only going to those feeders between 10 and 20 times a day, whereas another individual was going between 10 and 80 times a day. And even one time it went in over 100 times during the day. So very different behavior in terms of how they are actually accessing and dealing with that feed. The middle one is the average intake per feeding event. So the animal on the left was only going in and really having real small nibbly events. And so it was kind of going in and only eating 20 to 80 grams a day, whereas one of the others must have just about been camped in there and it was having um, on average 150 gram feeding events and up to 700 grams of just going in there and eating and eating and eating. Duration of feeding events, again, similar variation between individuals, and it was very repeatable for an individual animal how they behaved when they were in there. So the nutshell is that we have a really awesome facility at Ag Research in Vermeer. We're able to measure individual animal feed intake in a very detailed way. We know that this is a highly heritable trait, and we are seeing genetic variation between sires coming through in the progeny. We saw it when we had the thousand animals go through. We're seeing it with these low input animals going through. Ideally, and I know this is kind of my panacea of where, where this research needs to go, is we need to be able to have an accurate intake out in the field so that it's really relevant. And like with all of these things, that we can actually measure more and more animals. We're looking at the things like the CO2 from the pack trailer as being a proxy for intake. I also am doing work with um, accelerometers that we fit to the jaws of the animal that can look and predict intake based off those. There are um, a number of methods internationally where they can look at it, but at the moment in terms of getting true accurate data, this is, this is the gold standard and this is the way that we're doing it. So to the future, we're hoping to be able to get something that we can ramp up and roll out because this is a, a very important trait in terms of whether we think about it in terms of the methane story or if we think about it in terms of climate change and variable feed availability. It's a very important trait to, to be thinking about. Um, one of the other things is, I didn't really touch on it, but pulling back to that um, fatness story and body composition, we have those 600 animals with the full CT and we have all that ultrasound data. There is, and again, it's kind of, I think everybody's pretty sick of us saying, but we're still trying to untangle what's actually happening. But there definitely does seem to be a relationship with that body composition as well. We know that it costs a lot of energy to lay down fat, but once it's laid down, it's kind of an inert um, thing. Whereas if there is a lot of muscle going on and a lot of muscle requires a lot of energy for ongoing maintenance. So 
there is a bit of a story to unpick there. I think that it is going to be a positive story in terms of this whole resilience idea. Okay, so now we are um, going to open up a bit of a, um, a sort of less formal um, session with our steering group um, members. We are very fortunate with this project test to have some very dedicated builders on our steering group, which we um, discuss a lot of a lot of things through this project test. And um, yeah, a lot of them have have made changes in their own programs through their involvement with this. So. This is an opportunity for them to share some of those um, those insights and experiences with this test and with you all. So please, again, if you've got questions, just put your hand up and we'll shoot a, um, a mic box over to you so we can record it. Uh, I'll, introduce, I'll introduce myself, um, Daniel Wheeler. Uh, the main job is actually sheep scanning. Um, technically, I'm the lifestyler. Um, we just run 100 acres, 260 use. Um, started out with fins, morphed into fin texels, run a small um, shedding flock as well. Uh, 25 years since I've last stocked the lamb. Um, no, I haven't tailed any either. So we run all tailed sheep. Um, uh, and, and started out at that point. Um, always dag scored um, and have only recently started fix scoring. So, um. Afternoon, everyone. Alan Richardson, Overland Genetics, we farm in the Infant Dominion, North of Gore. Look, we went down this track um, 2004. We started breeding for low input. Um, from a, a Pernell Texel and a bit of Wilkshire base. Where are we today? We're at the stage that we're not docking any lambs. Don't have to dig about 60 or 70 percent of them. Uh, we're not dipping, and um, we just started um, first year not belling our sheep. So we're cutting a lot of cost out of our sheep, but we're still getting the same production. And, and cost wise, we're probably um, per sire about $1,500. If you're not selecting for those things, you're actually passing that cost on to, you, to your clients. Drenching and dagging. So um, yeah, I think that um, I'm pleased to see such a good turnout here and we need you guys to um, to push this to your, to your own clients and um, the industry as a whole because um, uh, what we're doing here is really exciting, it's working and it's where the industry needs to go. I couldn't agree more with everything that um, Alan's just said. I'm Kate Broadbent. I farm in the Upper North Island on the coast in an environment that's pretty challenging for um, facial eczema, parasites, and viral pneumonia. And I'm fortunate to have, um, I've had this flock for 12 years, but the previous owner had enough vision to stop drenching use 25 years ago and doing the FEC work. So as was alluded to inside, you know, it's not a quick trip. But the genetic gain is significant if you make those selection decisions. And um, if today's um, presentations don't fire up the breeding community to get on board with some of this genetic, the potential for this genetic gain, I don't know what will. Because it's, um, I think we've had some really cool presentations and a really strong positive message about what we can do and how much our industry and the marketplace, you know, the sheep of the future. So um, I take my hat off to Robert and his staff for a great job that they've done with a lot of work and to Sarah and the beef and lamb team for um, supporting it as well. And I just hope that we can, if there's, if there's commercial farmers here, go to your breeders and say, what are you recording? Are you recording DAGs? It's free, you know? Um, and, and as breeders, we need to be working together. We need to be able to source outside genetics from our flock. It's my biggest challenge is finding outside genetics because there's not enough breeders on the same journey that I am. So um, no, I think it's been a great positive day. And I think we've got, I'm, I'm excited. You know, there's a lot of challenges facing our industry at the moment, but there's huge opportunity. And this is a big part of it. So um, thanks everybody for being here and yeah, ask some questions and the guys here will answer them. That uh, 
they put up the, I think it's the sire percentile band saying there, you know, there was 40 breeders doing fact. There's over 600 breeders, I think now recording on cell. Is that about right? There's a thousand in the data set, I think. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's room for more. And it's a shitty job, but you just start doing it. And it, it's, it's really not the end of the world. You just do it. I do, I do mine by myself. I do five or 600 lambs and I just work away and get them done. But you can hire someone, get the vet team to come in, call, get the pay someone to come and stick their fingers up lambs bombs. It's not the end of the world. And the information you get is so valuable. It's so interesting. And even in a naive flock that hasn't been doing selection for fact, there will be gold. There'll be some in there that have got those genetics there that you haven't even identified. When we look at these new hoggets over here, um, I'm really pleased that there's been a level of pressure put on those animals because without that pressure, we don't get the variation. And I think too many people in the industry try and protect every animal, drench it continuously. And so you actually start breeding from the winners and the losers. What we're seeing here is um, under pressure, but they're still performing. And to not drench these, these animals and, um, and test them to the extreme is where we need to go as an industry because you're going to get the winners out of that and, and, the, and the losers will drop, drop out. That's working because when we look next door at those tutus, that's what they're still ending up like. So um, they're cracking tutus over there and don't be put off by a few dags because we need that variation too. There's animals in there that are very clean. You're not gonna have to touch them with a hand piece at all. The way labor is going in this industry, um, an animal you don't have to drench your bag looks pretty good to me. How did you choose what you put in and how has the information that you brought back changed what you're doing next at home? Uh, how it changed for me, I started feck recording. I hadn't done any feck recording. Um, so it started from there. Um, I chose my own rams um, purely on linkage. So basically I chose the ram that I'd used the most of so that I had sufficient numbers. With a small flock, um, I struggle with linkage with getting sufficient progeny on the ground from any given ram. In our pure fin flock, we're only mating less than 20 ewes per ram because we've only got a small number of ewes. Um, although we're able to generate 35 to 40 progeny out of those 20 ewes, we've, we've got to manage it quite well. So, so that was my selection from the ram I put forward. I picked the ram. I've had rams in two years. In the first year, I picked a ram. and it, It's just a sign of the times. He was a peeler, you know, peeled all down under his chin, nothing on his nuts, big open breech. You know, five years ago, you'd have called him as a, as a young one because it was a terrible wool trait. And now, of course, you that's what they want. They're screaming for them. Um, he wasn't the highest on like maternal worth, that sort of thing. He's pretty good for a fact. And he performed fine here. But then the last year, I just picked good average because that's representative. You know, just pick you know, a good average ram that you're going to use yourself because you're looking for linkage. But the peeler, I haven't used him again. He really wasn't a, a top, top ram, but I know I can sell the sons. Um, and again, it's, it's just about that linkage and represent it. And, and also when you do look at the results from these, this trial, it's one ram from the flock or, you know, and some of us have been in a couple of years, it isn't necessarily representative, but you're trying to be representative. So picking that good average gives you that, that opportunity. Just one comment. Most of our, our sheep in New Zealand are based on the Romney, the coot, wherefore the parental. So the crossbreed. So one of the challenges for, for, those base breeders is how are we going to shorten the tail? Because if we're going to end up not having being able to tail, or perhaps we've got to administer pain relief for every lamb that we tail, which is about a dollar twenty or something like that. Um, it's happened UK already. The Netherlands have been tail docking in sheep, so it is coming. And with those base breeds, how do we get that tail shorter? Because um, you wouldn't want to leave the tails on some of those sheep uh, because it's a hiding to nothing, isn't it? So that's something, do we outcross and get a shorter tail on those sheep and go back? I, I don't know, but that's why this, this trial is really important because it's going to identify some of those animals that have got those traits. Yeah, yeah it, it is. 
Kate's right, 70 to 80% heritability. It's one of the traits that you're going to get the, the most gain out of is selecting for tailing. So we, we don't tail anything that's from the hop or higher. And what we're looking for now is, is a tail that the wall peels off it. So um, not only is it short, um, there's no chance of bags getting on there. Hi. Um, we don't tail any of our animals at all, and most of the tails are above the hock. Um, they're mostly like rats' tails with hair. Yeah. They're breeches. We haven't tailed since I've been farming, I don't know, years. 25, 25 years. So we don't tail at all. You're ahead of the game. You're, yeah, you're well ahead of the game. Pohipi. Mm. Pohipi. It's a new breed because it's a Sort of short tail breed and scobies is the other ones that scobies is across the coarse wool and the bohepia the finer wool they were they were um david scoby at lincoln did all the research and 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 grew the flock and we it was going to the work so we bought it back way back hmm. that's good you said that i was just going to ask the question about what are your commercial farmers doing differently now that you're on this journey uh, are you are they reporting back um yeah large reach well, yeah, the, like the comments we're getting is that they're doing less dagging. And um, that, that's always the first thing they say. And, and now some of them are selecting for those shorter tails too. So that's coming through in their progeny. And, um, you know, here at the ability of 0.8, it's going to happen pretty quick, isn't it? Um, so, look, um, any animal that you don't have to drench, dag, or, or dock has got to be good as long as you're getting that performance. For, for you guys involved in the test, um, uh, are you are your commercial farmers? Um, do they know about the progeny test, and do they understand what's happening here? What, what's the sort of filtering through from the breeder community, I guess, to the wider community about what you're up to here? Uh, there's there's a lot of interest in it from commercial farmers, both from ram customers and scanning customers. So it's it's talked about, possibly because I'm talking about it. Um, but there's certainly a lot of interest in it. Um, and although, although no one from North Canterbury that I've spoken to in the last couple of weeks has managed to make it today, I had a number of people ring me about today that some of them were quite unexpected people that I wouldn't have thought would be interested in a, a following. They're thinking about it, they're talking about it, um, and that they know that this is somewhere they're going to have to get to eventually. Um, and, and that's been quite surprised. I've been surprised at just how open people are to it and how much they have talked about it. I think that it's as a group in that we need to um to drive this and what what the progeny test is really doing is quantifying what's happening out on farms and um and we with a wide range of size and that everyone's every one of those sizes has got some traits that the industry needs. So um the traits are there and I'm sure the animals are there, but until you test, you don't actually find out. So um that's why this it's really important, Beef and Land, that we um, continue to get some funds, Mickey, for this trial. And um, and, and um, that I believe this will become the most important sheep genetics trial that we run because this is where the industry needs to go. And um, and it's um, yeah vital that we, um, we've got the momentum now, but now we need to build on that. I'd, I'd give a plug to that as well. As a breeding community, you know, beef and lamb is our is the voice. That's that's those are our representatives. That's our levy money. But you know, we're looking for money in kind, and it's it's fine for me to go and bang on doors or one one other breeders. But as a group, we need to be unified. Going to beef and lamb, who can go to MB, who can go to MBI, who can go to the Sustainable Farming Fund. We need another one of these up north. You know, we need to be replicating this. We, we need this to carry on. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a matter of us knocking on those doors and working together. Because it, it's, it's kind of easy to get antagonistic. I can get a bit grumpy about not having enough money for what I want to bloody do. Because we've all got these ideas and we're all passionate about it. But it's we got to hold hands. And we've just got to, as a breeding community, go to our beef and lamb representatives and have that voice. The forum's coming up. And just so that they can then go you know, that step further and we can forward some of these ideas. These researchers here are just brimming with ideas of things that they would like to pursue. 
and it's all valid and uh, the time is now. Um, yeah, I'll just, just talk a wee bit about the, the management a bit more. So um, someone asked about the culling, like I say, that's every lamb born. Um, I mean, they are under pressure. So I fecal egg counted a, um, just a sample last week and they've come back as about 3000 eggs per gram at the moment. So we're fecal egg counting um, all of them next week. Um, and then they'll be allowed a drench after that. Um, the, the girls next door, like I say, the first thing you do with the, your commercial replacements is cull 20 or 30%. Um, we only, only culled three or 4% out of those. So, I mean, they averaged 67 and there was only a handful taken off the bottom. Um, and that's, that's all the way through to two loose. So, I mean, it, likewise, if you had taken another 10% off, they'd look even better. Um, so we're, we're pretty, pretty happy, really. I mean, there are some girls there that are struggling more than others, but, but you can't find the winners without putting them under pressure. And, um, and that's the thing, like, uh, we've talked, like, I mean, the other breeders mentioned it as well. It's about wanting options to go and buy outside size. And we don't have those options if more people aren't recording. Oh, do, you, um, do you measure DAGs? Oh, no, well, I, I don't really have any DAGs and I, I never use a dirty ram. Well, there's a big difference between not using a dirty ram and actually recording DAGs and selecting for a breeding value. Um, because, I mean, I've heard that time and time again, and they, they come here and um, just bloody DAGs for Africa. Um, yeah, so, I mean, they, they do need to record it. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, like I said, I mean, I did my honours on this stuff 25 years ago. I've been breeding for it for 20 years. And hosting this um, trial has only invigorated my passion even more. You, you see the difference between the genetics. You see what's possible. Um, and, yeah, not every – or no sheep is going to win at every trait. Um, but you can still go forwards pretty quickly if you just work out your goals and work out which traits are more important than others. And um, you might not go forwards in them all, but you might be able to shoot forwards in one. And as long as you're not going backwards in another, that might be worth it. Um, you've got to find out where you are now, work out your goals, and then work out a plan of how to get there. Um, yeah, I mean, a few people, I mean, Alan said he was thrilled with the audience here. Uh, and to be honest, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed with the, the crowd here. There's a lot of stud breeders come here, um, North Island, Southland included. Um, if they weren't here, the, to me, there's not enough industry people. There's not enough commercial farmers here. There's not enough vets here, um, stock agents here. They're the ones that really spread the word. Um, yeah, the, the, the pressure really comes on the stud breeder from the commercial customer. If the commercial customers start asking the hard questions or, or start turning away, then that's when the stud breeders will really start realizing they've got to do something about it. Um, yeah, I mean, th this stuff like the drench resistance and the work issues and the, the tailing, it's coming at us at a speed that we're not going to be able to cope with unless large numbers of stud breeders work together and, um, and record for the traits. If we do work together, well, God knows the, the industry could look fantastic in 10 years' time. Um, but if we're not careful, half, half the younger generation won't want to farm sheep. And, um, and then we'll get below a critical mass. It won't, breeders will give up because there's not enough rams to sell. The processors will have trouble getting into certain markets because they won't have enough volume to sell. They'll sign a contract, say, right, oh, we want, want X number of tons, and oh, we don't have X number of tons. Um, so to me, we, it's a serious call to arms, as it were, that um, the industry really needs to take seriously and get onto it as quickly as possible. Radio, just to, um, to wrap things up, just a few thank yous. Um, firstly, to today's speakers, thank you very much for, for traveling here and, and sharing your insights and things with us. It's been a really interesting day and some really cool stuff happening. So I'm glad we could all hear from you on that. Thank you for being here. Um, also, the team involved with putting today's day on. Um, it, as you can imagine, there's an immense amount of work that goes on behind the scenes to, to put these days on. And thankfully, COVID allowed us to actually do that in person this year rather than virtually. Um, 
again, massive thank you to Robert and all of the staff who are still here. Um, we we know it's a it's a massive undertaking, and we really do appreciate everything you do for this trial. Um, thank you to the steering group members who are all here. Um, some of you have travelled from far and wide. Kate's come down with a horde of breeders from the North Island. So, yeah, we're really pleased to have everyone here and be so well supported by them in this trial. And also, finally, thank you to all of you for, for dedicating your time to this this afternoon. Um, it's As Robert said, it's a really important space for our industry to, to start taking seriously because it's it's coming at us pretty thick and fast. So it's, um, it's really good to see so many here today. So thank you all for your time and um, I hope you've managed to take a few key points away with you and safe travel time. Thank you.